apparently there was a button on YouTube that I had to click to go live. I thought it would just go live as soon as I started streaming, but apparently not. Should be live now, right? Um, okay, now it's working. Okay, neat. Sorry about that. I usually stream on Twitch. I'm not very used to YouTube, and so, so things might be a little janky. Um, neat. I need to pull up a document. Uh, why not on Twitch? I want to try doing this on YouTube because I feel like the uh, audience on YouTube is more like diverse while Twitch is very gamer centric. And so I want to see, see if I can reach my target audience better on YouTube. So that's why I'm trying this now. Oh yeah, and then also on Twitch, my students get ads, which is kind of, kind of frustrating. Uh, and yes, there will be a recording. It'll stay on YouTube as soon as it's done. Uh, where are my notes? Here we go. Okay, what do you do? You have a class emote? Like, a, like an emote you use a lot. Like the previous students were using this like business emote, like this one. Anyway, react, react if you are present. Just to see if all of you are here, just react, react with your favorite emote so that I can see that you're here. Maybe I shouldn't have said favorite emote. Maybe I'm gonna get like 50 different things now. Neat. Okay. People are present. That's good. Uh, I'm not entirely sure if I'm present. Um, I am somewhat tired <laughs> and a little bit sleep deprived. So I hope that's not going to affect things too much. Um, okay. All right. I guess we're ready to start. Um, so for, maybe I should say who I am. Um, my name is Freya Holmer. Uh, I am a game developer, and I have been for 12 years, I think. I've been doing this professionally. Um, and then I've sort of been pivoting into doing more educational content, well, obviously teaching, um, and doing kind of like tech art stuff publicly. Uh, so I'm generally pretty focused on math, uh, shaders, and that kind of stuff. Um, so yeah, I have been working at various smaller companies. I've been doing freelance work. I co-founded a studio called Neat Corp, where we worked on a game called Budget Cuts. That was kind of like a VR, VR game. Uh, and I've since left to work on my own projects. And my own projects are usually uh, tools for Unity. Uh, so I've been, I made a shader editor a long time ago called ShaderForge. So this was before Unity had their own node-based shader editor. Um, and then more recently, I have. Um, I created a plugin called Shapes, which is a vector graphics plugin for Unity. Uh, so that's kind of my, the projects that I've been involved in that are most known, I suppose. Um, yeah, and and so that's that's who I am. Um, okay, and then let's let's jump into it. Um, so. I just want to talk a little bit about like what my purpose is, like why why am I here to to teach, right? Um, and I'm here to make you learn. I want you to get the tools that you need to code games. So everything I do is going to be centered around game development. Uh, you know, when you're in math class in school, quite often it feels a little bit like irrelevant. Like, when am I ever going to need the derivative of how many packets of pasta I buy like during a year. Like I feel like there, there's a lot of math that feels pointless and esoteric. And so, um, so I think centering something around game development is a really nice way to contextualize as for why these things are useful. Cause quite often it feels pointless. And, 
And so at any moment, feel free to ask me, when, when are we ever going to use this? Like, what's a use case for the dot product or whatever? Um, so just feel free to ask anything at any time. Because um, I do want to focus on things that are useful. Um, and so sort of by extension, I, I don't really care about whether or not you finish the assignments I give you. Uh, I don't really care about grades. I, I don't care about that at all. Um, so it's all about like what you learn and what you are able to do and how much I'm able to help you. That's my goal. Um, for better or for worse, I think you might get assignments from your head teacher at some point, uh, because like I'm guessing you're required to. Um, but, but yeah, so, so that's sort of how I look at it, I suppose. Hope that makes sense. Um, so with that being said, keep in mind like what standard you're setting, like not only for yourself, but like for others as well in class. Like if you don't do any assignments at all and you just kind of don't really watch any of the lectures, you don't learn anything, you're kind of, you might come off as a little bit lazy to your, your like fellow classmates. And keep in mind that your fellow classmates are going to be in the industry pretty soon. And if, if they have a view that, oh, you're the person that doesn't do anything, they're not motivated, they don't get anything done, then, then keep that in mind that, um, like, for instance, like, there was one time I had a class and I noticed that, that a student basically never showed up on time, they never did anything um, properly, and they cheated. Um, and so... Like my impression of them is not very good. <laughs> and so, so I just want, want you to keep that in mind that like all of you will be in the industry. It's not like you are separate from the industry at this point. Um, so, so be, so, so keep that in mind, be, be proactive and, and whatnot. Um, okay. Uh, will the assignments be made and graded by you? I will make the assignments, but I will not grade them. Um, the assignments will depend on where we are in class because the time scheduling is going to be different. Um, so it depends on what we've gone through and uh, what you know at that point uh, if you've been following class. Um, yeah, so, so they, they will be similar to the 2020 assignments, but I'm not entirely sure if they're going to be the same. It depends on where we end up at the end of this um, lecture. Um, yeah, so you can use uh, any Unity version if you want. I'm not going to expect you to follow along during class. Um, it's mostly for the assignments afterwards. Um, but if you want, you can follow along. Uh, but I'm not going to design it for that. I'm going to kind of just steam ahead. Uh, just to keep things a little bit more efficient. Um, okay. Um, but again, my goal here is to make you learn. If all of this is something you already know, it's fine if you kind of tune out a little bit. <laughs> like, I, I don't want to force you to do something you don't need to, right? Um, and again, ask, ask questions. Please ask questions. Every time someone asks a question and they're like, oh, this might be a dumb question, but it's a very good question. Um, and so please ask questions. That, like, I'm... I'm not infallible. There's quite, quite often I will miss things or misspeak. And, and so just always ask questions if something's unclear. Um, you students, you have your Discord chat. So please just type things in there um, and I will, I will read it. I'm used to reading while streaming. So, um, okay. All right. Um, Any questions so far? <laughs> People are typing, so I'm going to have some tea. Is it okay to ask a question even though I might know the answer just to share with others? Um, yeah, sure. Um, you can do that. Um, yeah, why not? I suppose. Um, not sure if I read this somewhere. You said in last year's recording, but you said we should use Unity. Will, will we get feedback on what we do from you? And if so, what Unity version should we download? Um, I, I recommend using Unity 2021.2 uh, or later. 
Um, but you can use anything like 2019 or later. It doesn't really matter. Uh, we're not going to do any like super like complicated like Unity version specific stuff. And so you can use whichever one. I just prefer using 2021.2 and onwards because you get newer C sharp features. Um, yeah. Uh, I understand the concepts by placing the logic in the right order is something new to me in coding. I find it to be difficult. Uh, yeah, we're not going to be doing that much coding. Uh, we're going to do it, but it's mostly going to be for the assignments and to like show an example of whatever it is we're talking about. Uh, so it's mostly going to be focused on math rather than code, uh, but we will do co do code. So um, yeah, um, will we be learning calculus concepts or mostly algebra? Um, so the plan is for me to do the first week the way that I usually do my math course. And then the second week, I'm thinking we can kind of do um, whatever you feel like doing or like what you would like to learn. Um, or I can just come up with some concepts if you don't have any ideas. Um, and so calculus is not, I don't know, someone's probably gonna shit on me for this, but calculus is not that useful in game dev. Um, you pretty rarely bump into calculus. And so it's not my priority. Um, but we can talk about it if you want to, but it's probably going to be like during the second week if you want to talk about that. Um, that's not to say that it's useless. It certainly is useful, um, but it's, it's less so than the concepts we're going to talk about uh, before then. So we're, we're going to start out with linear algebra because that is one of the most fundamental and important aspects of the math that you use for game dev. Uh, my experience when I took math two last year was that I could understand the concept and practice of math equations and methods, but struggled figuring out which ones to use and how to use them in real life examples. Yes, I'm going to try to use them in as many real life examples as possible, um, just to kind of ground it in reality, where reality is game development. Um, okay. And people in chat are saying that game physics uses calculus a lot. Yes, but most people, when making games these days, don't write their own physics engines. Uh, generally, most of that is handled by uh, the engine itself. You might use some calculus if you if you you write your own trajectory code or if you're writing splines. Um, but quite often, a lot of people don't really do that themselves. Um, and so, linear algebra and trigonometry and that kind of stuff is more important. Okay. Uh, any other thoughts? Can we survive in the industry without learning math? Um, no. You have to know a certain amount of math. Um, I think if you are a game programmer and you don't know some amounts of vector math, you will struggle a lot. Um, but that's why I'm here so that I can teach you how to, how to think about it, how to use it, how it works, all of that kind of stuff. So, so hopefully, hopefully you will learn it after, after these few lectures. Okay. All right. Vector math is fun, matrices not so much. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about matrices, but usually, or generally, we're just going to limit matrices to, to the specific use case of transformation matrices, um, because that is that is like the, the one place where you're going to frequently bump into them. Um, but matrices outside of transformation matrices are very rare in game development. OK. All right. Uh, how's my mic, by the way? I feel like I, I'm not sure if it's good because a cat dropped my preamp to the floor, so I don't have my compressor chain, and I have no idea what I sound like right now. <laughs> it's good. Okay, good.
Um, okay. Cool. Um, any chance to see cats? Uh, yes. Where are they? Well, there's only one cat right now. Uh, th that white blob over there, that's salad. So, so there you go. That's, that's one cat. Okay, but yeah, there, there might be cats in the background running about. Um, we have three cats. So there, there's either going to be, be a white one or a black one or a seal, <laughs> a brown one. <sighs> From your past lectures, I find your cat to be a little distracting. I don't know what to do about that. People say that, but it's like... I can't just tell my cat not to meow. Like, I don't know. I can't shut them into the bathroom. I there's I can't do anything about it. Okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um. All right. So. Um. I think we're ready to get started. So I think one uh, pretty fundamental question uh, that I think we should like ask ourselves wh whenever we study something, it's always good to ask why. Like why why would we study this topic, and like why why would this be a useful thing to know, right? Uh, when you're in school, quite often you're kind of just learning because you have to. But in this case, you're learning because it's useful, right? Um, and so I think the, um, for me, one of the things I really like about math is that this is just kind of my perspective. I don't know if you're going to agree, but I think math is super fascinating because no matter where you are, this is a field of study. Um, like even if you are like in some other universe on some other planet, maybe you're in a universe with different laws of physics math exists there. There is the study of math, as long as there's intelligent beings, I suppose. Uh, math will exist. It's kind of inescapable. And I think that is really fascinating um, because math is so fundamental that it's kind of the study of quantity, the study of space, of structure, and of change. And it's kind of hard to imagine a universe without those things, right? And so, so I think it's kind of cool that like any discovery you make in math can be made independently, literally anywhere else. Um, and so like the, the concept of like the circle constant or the value of like E, the golden ratio, like all of these things can be co-discovered everywhere, which I think is super cool. Um, and so it kind of underpins everything in physics, chemistry, and biology. Um, so it's, it's very similar to philosophy in that sense, that it's kind of the, the, um, the foundation that so much stands on. Like you can't do morality or ethics or politics without philosophy. Um, and so I, I feel like math is sort of a similar, similar thing when it comes to like the physical world. Um, and so it's kind of this like universal language that can describe any world. And any world, of course, includes virtual worlds. So we make worlds that we try to replicate our own world or slightly different worlds, but these worlds still follow rules that, um, that exist in math. Um, and so, so that's why I think math is cool, um, not only because it's useful, but also because of this like universality of math, which, which I think is neat. Um, and so, so I think apart from the usefulness of it, I think that that's a good reason to study it because it's kind of, it's fascinating, you know? Um, okay, all right. But we're gonna start at the basics. We're basically going to speed run math from when you started learning math, probably, <laughs> until somewhere in high school. Um, that's what we're gonna do. Um, I just need to open, create a new document. Um, is learning math beneficial in other areas for programming industry, not just the games industry? Uh, yes, but it's going to depend on the domain. Like if you're, if you're doing programming 
and you're working with like architecture, or if you're programming and working with like statistics, the kinds of math you're going to learn is going to be different. Um, and so it kind of depends on the domain, but it's generally, generally it's going to be useful, right? Um, and it's, it's not like, I think quite often anything you learn in math will sometimes turn out to be useful eventually, um, given enough time. Uh, but of course, sometimes you want to try to focus on the things that are most effective in the moment to focus on, right? Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to try to take one break for every hour. Uh, so we're going to do a short, like, maybe five five minute break, 10 minute break, just so you can go to the bathroom and stretch your legs and whatnot, or get some tea. Um, so so if, if I forget to do a break, feel free to let me know, because uh, I sometimes forget. Uh, are there any other, other areas of math you recommend us looking into? They won't go into this course. Uh, that depends on what we're gonna do the second week. Um, I have a plan for the first week. The second week, I wanna leave open and kind of improvise depending on what you want to talk about. Um, and so what I recommend depends on what we'll already cover. Um, and so, yeah. There are many areas you can look into, like an endless sea of things. Okay. All right. Uh, I got my notes. Mm. Okay. Oh, and sorry, YouTube chat. I'm going to ignore you until we get to breaks. Because <laughs> I'm focusing on, on my students at Future Games. Uh, there's more information in the description if you have questions. Uh, okay. Where is my... Hell yeah, we did it. Um, I guess if we all write down second week ideas as we go, and then we can bring them up at the end rather than spamming a second week idea. Um, yeah, you can always ask questions about anything during the lectures. Um, but if you're asking something that might be a little bit too off topic, I don't want to go too far into a tangent. Um, and so, yeah. Um, but yeah, feel free to keep a mental, mental notes on things you want to talk about. Um, and then we can, then we can do that the second week. How many weeks is this course? Two weeks. We have, uh, I plan for three lectures uh, per week, uh, although this one is going to be cut short because you had other things scheduled. Um, so, but yeah, it, it's going to be about three lectures per week and we might do, uh, focus a little bit more on working on assignments the second week. Um, but, but yeah, the first week is going to be lecture focused and assignments. I'm going to do assignments after every lecture, but they're going to be pretty small. You'll have shaders later, yes. <laughs> okay, my monitor is very, very dusty. Um, so apparently some, some, some group of students have something scheduled after lunch, but not all students. I'm a little bit confused. It's some sort of retrospective for the thing. Um, okay, non-Stockholm people have things scheduled. Okay. And so I will, I will move those hours that you're missing out on to a different, different day. I don't want y'all to miss out on, on hours, so, so don't worry about that. Okay, all right, let's get started. Let's get into, let's get into the, the basics. Let's talk about numbers. I think you're pretty familiar with those at this point, um, but let, we, we should cover them anyway because they're very useful. Um, 
So if you have, let's see, I hopefully, hopefully you talked about this concept called a number line, uh, where you can sort of imagine this line where you can place all numbers on. So you have uh, zero, uh, we have one, two, three, four, et cetera. Um, and then on the other end, you have the negative numbers. So you have negative one. It's, sorry for my handwriting, it's kind of bad, um, but it's hopefully readable. Okay, so the basic number line is kind of like this, this line where we can place all numbers that we, um, that we use, right? And so these numbers are often called, uh, the ones you see here that are whole numbers, uh, are usually called integers. Um, so that's whole numbers, and then any numbers in between um, are going to be have like a decimal point. So between two and three, we have two point two point five. So that's halfway between two and three. Uh, and so so this line kind of contains uh, all um, all real numbers. So this is also called a real number line. Um, and and so when you think about numbers, uh, I think it's good to think about them as kind of like a position along this line, right? Um, and so you can sort of conceptualize the, the number two, you can sort of think of two as an offset from zero. And you can even draw that as an arrow if you want to. And so, so this arrow sort of represents the number two or the position two. Um, or you can do the same thing for negative one. Maybe you can draw that as an arrow as well. And so this would be negative one and this would be two. Um, and so, the um, so whenever you, you think about what numbers are and how to use them, then it kind of depends on the context. So if you're um, if you're using these as positions, then you can you can manipulate these and add them together and like reason about them. Um, so if this is the position of an object, so let's say maybe you have a, a player character standing here. Uh, then we can represent their position using a number, right? If we change the number, we change the position of the, the player. Um, so this is a very one-dimensional game. It's kind of flat, uh, but we can still, still use, the, um, use these numbers to represent things. So for instance, if we want to know uh, how far away is the player from four, for instance, that is a question we can ask that actually makes sense and something we can calculate. And so, so let's first like draw the value four. We can draw that as an arrow as well. Uh, so if we want to get the, the distance between two and four, I'm sure many of you are familiar with this, this concept of checking the, the distance between two values, but then we would generally do something like four um, minus two. So if we take this vector, but we cut off, or this arrow, and then we cut off this part, uh, then we get the, the distance between um, two and four, right? So four minus two, that gives us two, and two is the, the distance between here from the player to um, the value four, right? Um, okay, so that's just kind of like the, the basics of number manipulation. You can, you can just kind of uh, subtract to get the difference between two values. Uh, then you can also add them to, to, get, the, to get offsets. Um, so, so maybe you have like some some object that's floating around uh, behind the player or something. Maybe you have a maybe you have a camera that's following the player. So maybe maybe this is a camera, and you want to place this camera relative to the player. So let's say the player is moving, then you want the camera to follow the player. So then you can set the camera position based on the player position. So maybe you do player position plus some offset. So maybe you want the camera to be like one unit away from the player, then the camera position would then be player position two plus one, and then you get the position of the camera. Uh, and so I, I think it's good to think of numbers as things you can manipulate relative to each other, measure against each other, and sort of think about them spatially um, as existing in this along this line. Uh, I just need to go open a window because it's really warm in here for some reason. Uh, so I'll, I'll be right back.
is very warm. <clears throat> okay. Um, so, um, so we can sort of sort of make up some rules that can be useful. Um, and so, so first we have the the rule of addition. Like we can add add these together. So we can add numbers together to to offset them. Uh, we can also scale things if we multiply them. Um, so that's kind of the, the two operations that we usually work with. Um, OK, uh, let's see. I just need to erase things because it's getting a little, little messy. We keep the player. I don't know if we keep the player. <clears throat> okay, so um, so we can already like write some some useful rules when working with numbers. Um, so so let's say we want to write a general rule to get the distance between two numbers. Um, and so let's say we have a number um, a, and then we have a number. Uh, B, and we want to get the distance between these two. Uh, so let's say we write um, So if you want to get the distance between A and B How would we do this? Well, like I mentioned before we can subtract things to get it get the difference like we did before um, so, so if A is the character here, let's say that that's the value of A, and then we have B is the value here, and we want to get the distance between these two. So the distance would represent the, um, the number that represents the distance between these two, right? Um, and so the thing we did before is that we did B minus A, um, but if B is instead of instead of being here, it would be on the other side. So maybe B is here. Then our distance is going to be negative, and generally distances are not negative because again, if, if we're doing the same thing here of B minus A, um, we're going to do one, so the value of one, and then minus two. So when we do minus two, we're not going to add it, but instead we're going to flip it to the other side because we're subtracting it. And then if we sort of take these two, stack them on top of each other, uh, it ends up pointing back to uh, negative one. So now that we measure the distance, it says negative one. When, you, when it's possible to get a negative distance, uh, that's called a signed distance. Um, so signed as in signed. So a signed distance just means that the distance can be negative depending on some conditions. Uh, but usually when you say just distance, um, you want it to always be positive. Um, so it's, it can only be negative if it's a signed distance. Uh, and sign is referring to the, um, the sign of the value is either plus or uh, minus, right? So that's what, that's what sign means. Um, and so, so we want some way to get the distance between these two, but maybe we don't want it to be negative. Uh, then we can use a function called the absolute value. Um, so in code, you would generally call a function called um, abs of some value x. Or maybe we should call it a, just to be consistent. Um, so the absolute value of a, mathematically, you would write that with vertical bars. So you would have a vertical bar. Uh, and then a uh, vertical bar. Uh, the absolute value uh, kind of gets you the length of the arrows that we were drawing. Um, so if we get the absolute value of 1, uh, then that's going to give us 1, because the length of this is 1. Uh, the length of a is 2. Um, so that doesn't seem surprising. But if we go to the uh, negative values, like if we have another vector that goes to negative 3, then the absolute value of this is 3. It's not negative 3. So abs the absolute value function basically turns negative values into positive values. Um, so
So that's what the absolute value function does. So if we want to get the, um, the distance between two objects and we don't want to have negative values, uh, we can use the absolute value to make sure that we don't get that, right? Uh, and so what we then do is we get the absolute value of b minus a. And so this is how we get the distance between two numbers. Um, and so whenever you want to compare two things, see how far away things are from each other, then you can use this distance function. Uh, okay. And then, relatedly, let me just move things around. And again, just let me know if you have any questions at any moment, and I will be happy to answer them. Um, oh shit, I also missed a question. Um, can we also manipulate vectors through the transform component, like placing camera behind the player? Yes. We're going to get to that. <clears throat> um, is it better to use the built-in distance function or calculate it ourselves? Uh, we're going to get to that too. Um, the answer is that it kind of depends. Uh, okay. Didn't miss any more questions. Um, okay. So we now have a way to get the, the distance between two numbers. Um, so we have the, um, the distance is just the positive distance between two values. We can get the distance between like negative three and two, <clears throat> and we will get, get a value of five because that's the distance between, between these two. No matter what order we, we check it in, we're still going to get a positive value as long as we do the absolute value of this difference, right? Um, <clears throat> we're going to get to vectors soon. Don't worry. This is, this is, this is a convoluted way to get to vectors. Um, all right. And so another property we might be interested in um, is, sorry, I need to drink. Please remind me to drink. Um, my voice tends to get very coarse the longer I go on. Um, okay, so so now we know how to get the the distance between two values. Uh, we know how to get the absolute value or the the kind of the length or the magnitude of a value. Um, but there's another property that can be super useful. Um, sometimes you have numbers that can be well on either side of the 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 number line of course like some values are negative some values are positive um, but sometimes it can be useful to get the sign of a value and the sign of a value is kind of like it kind of tells you what direction it's pointing in um, and so if we have another value c over here then c is pointing in this direction but b is pointing in this direction right uh, and then A is pointing in the same direction as B. Um, and so, so one thing you can do uh, to figure out what side of something is on, um, you can use another function that is called just the sine function. So S-I-G-N, not S-I-N. That's for later. Um, so the sine of a value. Uh, so that, that gives you the, the direction. Um, basically. So is it positive or is it negative? And the direction is going to represent it using values of either negative one or one. Um, and if you want to get the, the direction of some value, um, then the kind of like algebraically how you figure that out, I just need to move this because I, I don't know. I don't know how to fit things in. Um, and so algebraically, how you get the direction, like let's say you have the value of C, B, and A, and you want to pass it into a function, and you want to get the direction out of it. So C should be negative 1, B should give you 1, and A should also give you 1, because that's the kind of the, the, the unit vectors, the unit directions, that, that we, the, the two directions that we have, right? And the way to do that is you take the value of A, and then you divide it, by the uh, absolute value of A. 
So you basically divide it by the length uh, of it. Um, and so that gives you the, the sign. So, so that if whatever value you pass in, you're going to get either negative 1 or 1. Um, and then if you, uh, th there's a special case if you're passing in zero, uh, because as, as you probably heard, dividing by zero is generally undefined in math. Um, and so dividing by zero is usually a bad time. And so th the sine function usually has a special case where if a is zero, it either returns zero or one. Uh, usually the mathematical sine function always returns uh, zero for, for zero. Uh, but then for some functions and some math libraries, depending on what you're using, it might return uh, one for zero. Uh, so it really depends, but usually it will, will return zero. In any case, it's always defined at zero. Um, okay. Did that, did that make sense so far? Any, are there any questions? Uh, everything until the very last part with sign. Okay, so if you have a, so if we wanna get the, the sign of some value, so let's say we want to try the value 2. Um, so if we divide that by the absolute value of 2, um, then this is effectively, it's x divided by x, right? Because the absolute value of 2 is 2. So this is going to be, this is equivalent to 1 divided by 1, which is 1, right? Um, if you have a negative value, so if we have negative 3, and then we divide that by the absolute value of negative 3, then what's going to happen is that the absolute value here is going to be equivalent to uh, 3. So we get negative 3 divided by 3, which is equivalent to negative uh, 1 divided by 1, which is equivalent to negative 1. There's a lot of lines here. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so we get negative 1. Um, and so effectively what the sine function does is negative values give you negative 1, Positive values give you 1, and 0 gives you 0. Um, and that's kind of just how it's defined. It's just, we just decide that that's how it works, right? <clears throat> and you, you can implement it using the uh, a division, but sometimes you just do it as an if statement. Like, if it's greater than 0, return 1. If it's less than 0, return negative 1. If it's 0, return 0. Uh, so that's, that's quite often the, the way you, you just implement it. But if you want to do it algebraically, this is how you would do it. Yes, all of these are built-in math functions. That is, that is true. Uh, where would you want a number to be simplified to 1 or negative 1? Um, so quite often when you measure things in games, you get a floating point number, as in a, a, a value that could be any number, either negative or positive. doesn't have to be integers. Uh, so quite often you want to check which side of something you are on. Um, so, so let's say that maybe we're looking top down on a, um, maybe it's a car in a game. So let's imagine this is the center point of a, a car that is just a box. Um, and so this, maybe this car is moving forward. And then you want to know, maybe you're writing an AI for a car and you want to know which side which direction should it turn if an object is here? Or which direction should it turn if an object is here? Or here, and so forth. And, and so, so that's one case where you can use the sign to know which side of the car is the object on, uh, given a value uh, for the, the relative position of some object, right? Um, and so you can sort of use that to determine, should we turn left or should we turn right? Um, so that's, that's that's a use case for the for the sign. So generally, it's used for which side of zero is it on, um, and then that has various use cases like that. Okay. Uh, oh, each bomber guy in chat. Hello. 
I also can't wait to watch this when I wake up. Uh, I guess we're going into this later, but how would that look with the relative position and not zero as the point? Uh, we, we're going to do that later. Um, that's going to be... Um, yeah, that's going to be later. We're going to get into that because that involves more advanced things that we're going to talk about soon. Um, okay. Cool. How are we doing on break, by the way? I've completely forgotten time. Uh, okay. Do you want to do 10 minute break or a five minute break? Vote in student chat. Maybe I should clean this up. Uh, ten, five, four, five, 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 five. five. <laughs> okay, uh, twenty nine. Uh, okay, I think I think the consensus is five. So we're gonna go for five minutes more, and then we're gonna take a five minute break. Um. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. I need to bring up my notes. Um, okay, we're actually at a really good break point right now. <laughs> okay, we should probably do a 10 minute break then. Um, or we could do the five minute break now, but then we have a weird, we don't have a natural point to end the break if we do the five minute break now. Um, Okay, let's do a 10 minute break. Let's resume at, at, at the 10 o'clock. Um, I'm still gonna be here, or actually I'm gonna make some tea, but other than that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be here during the break. I'll be right back. Just hopped onto the stream and I walk away. Well, yep, that's that's why. Okay, how, how's the YouTube chat doing? Any tips on shaders? Uh, watch my shader course on on my channel. That's my tip. It's a very general question, so. Will this be uploaded to YouTube? Yes. All of this is gonna stay on YouTube after after the whole the whole thing is done, so yes. Um Do you have a schedule for the other lessons? Uh, they're going to be tomorrow and on Friday. Are your Twitch overlays still on? Oh yeah, should probably not have that. Thanks. Tomorrow and Friday, what about Thursday? Um, I don't. Ha I didn't initially plan to do anything on Thursday, so Thursday was gonna be just a work on your own. I'm gonna give you an assignment and then you work on it on Thursday.
when should we use magnitude versus square magnitude? Um, I'm going to get into that later, but effectively square magnitude is used when you're comparing, just comparing distances. If something is closer or farther away than some threshold, uh, then you can use squared magnitude because you don't need to know the actual magnitude. You just need to know if something is less than or greater than. Uh, and square magnitude is much faster to calculate. And so it's, it's usually an optimization. Um, but we're going to get into that later. So that's spoilers. So we shouldn't talk about that now. How dare you spoil things? Jeez. Okay, my tea, my tea is ready, so I'm going to go get the tea. You have a sandwich. That's great. Nice. I'm I'm happy already. Water. That's a good point. I need water. I'm gonna go get water. I used to suck at square roots. It's convincing to know the computer suck at it too. Yeah. Let's see. We got four more minutes of break. YouTube chat. Do you have any? Do you have any questions before I disappear into the Discord chat of the students? Uh, I find the way you explain math extremely intuitive. Any chances of something like this, but aimed at a younger audience? Um, I've never consider that usually my audience is game developers, like people who know how to code, but forgot all of math. <laughs> That's my very specific target audience. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't, I don't really, I haven't thought about that. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. Wait, are there people, are there future game students that haven't, that are not in the student discard? Uh, 
They're like five different servers. That's true. I don't really know how all of this works. It's the one called FG22-FTGP. You don't have that one? Uh, are there any students in FG22 that can invite uh, Tor? I don't know if I have invite permissions. Okay, you're doing the invites, good. You don't have invite permissions either, but I'm guessing there's someone has to have it. At least the class representatives. I'm hoping, <laughs> guessing. <clears throat> what do I need to do? Uh, I'm getting people in YouTube chat who say they are FG22 students who haven't gotten an invite to this server. Um, looks like Udit. I don't know how to pronounce your name. Udit. 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 I, I think you're you're on it. Uh, is there a cheat sheet for those useful math functions? Um, maybe. Um, <clears throat> I usually like save the all of my notes that I draw during my math class, so I could send that. Probably gonna post it on Twitter at some point. Uh, are we going to touch upon imaginary numbers, maybe with quaternions? Um, I don't have any plans to, but I could. Again, the second week, we can slot things in if you want me to talk about stuff. Um, and so I could, but it's up to you, really, because imaginary numbers are rarely used in games. Uh, but if you want me to talk about it, we can do that the, the uh, second week. Okay, um, should we continue or do we need more time? I don't know what's, what's going on with the invites. Okay, you got the invite sent. That, okay. Uh, one thing about the, um, I don't know how to vet the YouTube chat. I don't know who's an actual Future Games student or if someone just wants in on the Future Games server. Um. Okay, you're here now. Okay, it looks like a lot of students on the Quereftio site didn't get an invite to this server, I think.
I think that's what's going on, right? Okay, we're resuming as soon as this is resolved. Okay, T. Okay, all right, let's continue. I'm guessing you're all back. Are you all back? Are you all ready to continue? Or did we all zone out? We might be missing one breakfast though. Oh, now they're in. Okay. Are we ready to ready to resume? <laughs> I think we got everyone in who needs to get in, right? Was it just two people? I think it was those two people, as far as we know. Okay, all right. Um, let's resume. Uh, there we go. React to that if you're present. And then we're going to get started. See, React messages are so good because like all the introverts, they don't have to type anything. They could just click, click a button and then, then it's done. Okay. All right. Let's see. Let's shuffle things around a bit. Okay, interacting with the UI in Photoshop using a tablet is really, really inconsistent and weird. I don't know why. It's really annoying. Okay, so I've been talking about numbers up until this point, um, although I'm sort of interpreting them as arrows. 
And this kind of interpretation is usually something you reserve for doing for vectors. So we're going to talk about vectors now. And so the idea of having a number line like this, where you assign a value to each position along a specific line, um, we can extend this idea to two dimensions instead of just one. And so we're going to we're going to add another number line that is going to be perpendicular to the, the first. I merged that too early. Oh no. Oh geez, my desk is messy. Um, so now we've taken the same number line and we created a new one um, that is perpendicular. And we're going to give these some names. So let's merge those. There we go. OK. The layers of these lectures tend to get very messy after the lecture is done. All right. So now we have another number line. And so this one is perpendicular to the first one. And this one also has numbers. So we're just going to do the same thing. We have numbers one, two, three. Actually, let's do the other side. One, two, three, um, four, etc. And then we have negative one, negative two, negative three, and negative four. And so now what we've done here is that we've created a coordinate system that has two axes. And so this axis is called the x-axis. And then this one is called a y-axis. And so instead of just one number line, we have two of them. And so just like we could determine a position along this line, like, you know, the player has a position and we could, we could represent the position using a number. Um, for this one, we can represent position for uh, using two numbers. So we're going to have two numbers where each number is associated with each axis. So for example, if you want to represent this coordinate, like this point, we can do, do that using two numbers. So when we use two numbers, we usually write it in parentheses like this. Um, and so if we now look at the, the number lines, you can see that this one is aligned with two on the y-axis, and it's aligned with three on the x-axis. Well, kind of, assuming I drew this perfectly. Um, and so the way to re represent this position is using two numbers. So that's going to be three and two. And so this right here is a vector. And quite often we, we represent them using arrows like this. So just like we did for the, for the uh, numbers or the, the scalars. So these are scalars or numbers or values or real numbers. Um, we can do the same thing using vectors, where you have two numbers and they together represent a position. Um, and so these are absolutely fundamental everywhere in games. Uh, vectors are used to represent um, positions in space. It's used to represent directions. It's used to represent uh, relative offsets. It's used to represent velocity. It's used for like absolutely everything. Uh, so the concept of vectors um, is extremely ubiquitous, and so that's why we're gonna we're gonna talk about vectors. And again, this can represent any coordinate in space. So it doesn't even have to be integers. It can be like halfway between three and four. Uh, but the the general concept is that you have two numbers, where the first one is the x coordinate and the second one is the y coordinate, and it tells you where you are along that axis. Um, and so just to do another example, uh, we can do another one that is maybe here. 
And so this vector would be on x coordinate negative four and a y coordinate of uh, one. Um, okay, and again, we can we can represent this using vectors if we want to. Um, so we can draw draw it as an arrow like this. You don't always draw them as arrows. Sometimes you draw them as points. Kind of sometimes it depends on use case, but it's just one way of visualizing it. Um, okay. Did that make sense so far? Because this is incredibly important to to have a have a clean grasp on and to understand. Uh, because again, this is ubiquitous in in games. Um, So, so did that make sense? This is basic math in high school. Yes, that is true. And I'm trying to go through all of high school. Well, not all of high school, but the select important things in high school, just to make sure that everyone is caught up and on the same page, right? And a lot of people forget math. People are typing. Um, how would you go about making non-Euclidean vectors? Um, I, I haven't really worked with non-Euclidean vectors, but I'm guessing it's just a matter of interpretation, like how you interpret the the two numbers in the tuple and how you operate with them, right? It's going to be different depending on the non-Euclidean space, but... <clears throat> um, okay. All right, I'm guessing this is clear so far. So we're going to continue. Um, okay, and so when you have vectors like this, uh, just like how we had arrows or numbers, we can add them together. Um, so if you want to do uh, A plus B, then we basically take this arrow and stack it on top of A. Um, and the new position we end up with here um, is then 3, because um, the value of B is 1, the value of A is 2, and if we add one on top of it, on top of two, we get three. Um, two plus one is three, imagine that. And so we can do the same thing for vectors. So we can, we can take the, the arrow of one vector. So let's do this one. Um, and maybe not take everything with us. And then we stack it on top of the other one and then we add them together, and then we end up with a new vector that is going to be at this location here. So if this is vector, uh, maybe we should color code this. So if this is vector A, and this is vector B, then adding A plus B gives us this coordinate right here. Um, and so we can call this vector C. And so C in this case is A plus B. Um, so C um, equals A plus B. And when we add vectors together like this, we basically just add the numbers in each component. Um, so C in this case uh, is going to be uh, negative 4 plus 3. Uh, so that's on the x-axis, that's going to be uh, negative 1. And on the y-axis, we have 1 plus 2, and that's 3. 
So now we've added these vectors together. So that's, that's vector addition is very straightforward. Uh, you take them, just add them together component by component, and this is what we get. Um, so, doo -doo -doo. All right, so that's vector addition. Uh, subtraction works in a very similar way. Uh, and subtraction is particularly useful. Um, I hope this made sense, by the way, how, how we got C from A and B. Um, OK, and then subtraction is very similar, um, where you still do it component-wise. And it's effectively like adding the negated version of some vector. Uh, so let's say we want to calculate um, A minus B. Um, so we have a minus uh, b, and so that's going to be, I guess we're, we're going to find a new vector, let's call it d. So if we want to do subtraction, then uh, one thing that's really useful to keep in mind is that um, subtraction is basically always the same as adding the negated version of some other number, right? Um, so if, if you do like 5 minus 3, that's a bad number, 5 minus 4, uh, this is the same thing as uh, 5 plus negative 4. And so vector addition, we, we can use vector addition to interpret this. So we just need to know how to negate uh, vectors. And negating vectors, as in uh, flipping them or just turning, um, just changing the sign of them, um, you do that component-wise as well. So if we want to do a minus b, we can just figure out minus b. And so minus b is just reflecting this b vector to the other side. Um, and so we're going to get the vector all the way to here. So this vector um, is negative b. And then we add those together. So now we can add uh, a plus negative b. So we have negative b over here. And then we add that to a. And so we're going to end up, again, we take this vector, place it on the edge of this vector, uh, and we're going to end up outside of our number line because I don't know how to plan. Um, so effectively, we're going to end up at, let's see, 4 plus 3. Uh, that's going to be very far away. <laughs> it's going to be at like 7 somewhere. We have 6, and then we have 7. So we're going to be here and down one. So here's our here's our new vector going between here. So this is our vector uh, d. Okay. So d is now a minus b. Um, and one way you can um, wait, is this right? I feel like I, I feel like I missed something. Uh, yes, D is from zero. Um, but I feel like I did something wrong. Hold on. Uh, oh yeah, it's from zero. Sorry. That's why I thought I did something wrong. That's the position we get, so that's correct, but the vector should be drawn from zero, not relative to A. This long vector right here, that's D. Thank you. OK, uh, so this vector D, uh, it might look a little weird to put it here, uh, but effectively, when we do uh, A minus B, this vector is the same as the vector from b to a. 
So if we draw this line here between these two, it's getting a little cluttered. Sorry about that. So this long vector is also D. Um, and so what, what we basically get is the difference between these two positions. Um, and so, so one way you can interpret this, when you do A minus B, that is effectively, um, like colloquially and in language, um, it would be like um, the vector from B to a. That, that's, that's what you get from this. And this is a very useful thing to keep in mind uh, because you, you quite often use relative vectors like this um, when you want to know some offset or displacement between two coordinates, right? Um, so this is kind of the, the difference between two vectors. Um, a minus B is not the same as B minus A, right? Yes. Um, the um, that is not the same thing. And that's the same for numbers. Like, um, it's the same thing for numbers. B minus A, A minus B don't give you the same results. Um, so th those are different. Um, in math language, I think that means that they're non-commutative. I think I sometimes mix them up, but I th that subtraction is non-commutative, but addition is. Um, okay. So, now that we have the, um, let's see, maybe I should clean this up a little bit. Let's remove C. We don't need C anymore. I'm sorry, C. But you were useful while you, while you lasted. Um, okay, so the, um, let's see, maybe I should, although sorry about the screaming kids in the background, I think there's like a kindergarten somewhere here, and so if someone is screaming, it's not my fault. I don't know why kids scream so much, it's kind of kind of obnoxious. Uh, okay. Uh, let's actually erase this one too. Don't really need this. Don't need that. You don't hear anything? Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so um, D is, is now the, again, we get the, the vector from B to A. Um, and this is kind of a, a bit of a cursed thing, uh, because quite often it's easy to mix these up. Like quite often when you do math, it's easy to think that this is the vector from A to B, but this is from B to A. So it's a little bit reversed. Um, it's something, something to keep in mind whenever you're doing this. Um, and the uh, and flipping these two actually gives you a different vector uh, that gives you the uh, negated version of this as in you get the vector going from uh, a to b if you flip them so then you would get this vector right here uh, so this would be negative negative d um okay Uh, it's also worth keeping in mind, sometimes vectors are points and sometimes they're directions. Um, yeah, it kind of, this is a matter of interpretations, uh, interpretation, because like inherently vectors aren't anything. It's all just what we interpret them to be. And that's not really like encoded in the data type itself. It's always just numbers. Um, but if we use those numbers to represent a velocity or if it's a position or a local space offset, or maybe it's a color, like it could be anything. We can use them to represent a whole host of things, right? It doesn't have to be uh, anything in particular, but the, the vectors themselves have no knowledge of space or context. And you all, you just have to keep that in mind and remember it. 
I usually recommend naming your vectors after what they are. Um, so if it's a position, make sure to make that clear that this is a position relative to some center of some space. Um, if it's a local position, make that clear in the variable name. Um, if it's a, a direction, then just make that clear. Um, just to make sure that you, you know what the purpose of this vector is and how you got there and the context it's supposed to be used in. Um, it's very useful to keep in mind because uh, you can often get confused and forget how, how and what things are. Um, so for instance, this vector D is kind of, this is a relative vector. It's, it's a vector sort of relative to B, the way that we interpret it now, right? Uh, but the numbers themselves just represent you know, this vector going from zero. Um, but the, there's no difference between this and this. We're just drawing them at different locations, but they have the same uh, values in the vector. Um, and so uh, that's a good thing to keep in mind. Uh, vectors don't have an origin. They only have their two numbers. Uh, so you don't have a start and an end. Uh, you only have the endpoint. And so D here, we're just interpreting D as something relative to B, right? Um, okay. All right. I hope that made sense. Um, We're going to move things around a little bit. What? Photoshop, let me, let me move things. Thanks. Okay, so now I uh, should probably clean this up. Actually, let's duplicate it. Clean slate. All right, um, wait, where'd my numbers go? Oh no, I lost, we will lost the numbers. <laughs> oh geez, oh no, I'm sorry. Oh, this is real awkward. I can feel my, my ratings drop. My students are judging me so hard right now. Oh geez, okay, there we go. Um, will you upload the slide? Uh, yes, I can send you this whole document once it's, uh, once we're done. Uh, why do we go all the way to five here, but only to four there? That's a mystery. Um, okay. So. Stop. Photoshop, behave. Right. So um, if we then want to, again, like we did here with the player, we can get the distance from uh, between two things, right? We have the player uh, and then maybe some object. Uh, maybe it's a, it's, it's a box. That's how creative we're going to be. It's a box. So we, we want to know the, the distance to some box. Then again, uh, we can use this, this function here where we take the difference between the two numbers. Um, and then you get the absolute value of that. So we get the length of the vector between these two objects. And in this case, the, uh, which order you do it in doesn't matter because the length of these two vectors are the same, right? Uh, and so if we want to translate this into two dimensions, things get a little bit more complicated, but still very similar. 
Um, so let's say you have a vector here. So let's call our code this from the start. Um, so we have this vector here. So this is A. And then let's do another vector. We're going to do this as our vector B. Um, now, if we want to get the distance between these two, then what we really want, again, if we look at, look at the way we did it for numbers, we get the difference between them and then get the length of that, right? And we can do the same for the vectors. Uh, just like we did before, uh, we can subtract these two to get the vector representing the displacement from one to the other, right? Or the difference between the two. Um, so that gives you the, the vector just subtracting those two numbers. So um, that gives you, oh boy, actually let's do it in white. Drawing straight lines is very hard. I'm, I'm sorry. Still, still working on my artist chops. Okay, imagine these are overlapping. Uh, so, so this gives us the, the difference between the two. So in this case, uh, this would be uh, B uh, minus A, right? Like that's this white vector. Now, if we want to get the uh, length of this, uh, this vector, um, things get a little bit more complicated. We can't just do the absolute value like this. Uh, so we have, to do, um, we have to do something a little bit more special than that. And you might remember from, from math class in when you were in high school, you talked a lot about triangles, right? I'm, I'm guessing you remember this. You had a triangle um, and then you had some side lengths. Um, so you had the, the hypotenuse and then, then you have some, 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 I forget the names of these. Usually it's like the opposite, but we're not doing angles. Let's just call them A, B, C. Uh, so we have A, we have B, and we have C, right? Um, and we actually have a very similar situation here. If we want to know the length of a vector, what's really happening here is that we can, we can draw this triangle, right? So we have a triangle with a 90 degree angle. And so this just boils down to the uh, Pythagorean theorem. Uh, we just, uh, you probably remember that one, right? There you go. Um, shit. Uh, let's color code this. You think you remember it. <laughs> That's fine. I'll, I'll repeat it, don't worry. Okay, so the Pythagorean theorem um, is, is kind of a straightforward way of, of knowing the length of C. Uh, so in this case, if we have these two, uh, these two lengths, we can figure out the length of C using a pretty straightforward relationship. Um, so if we have C squared is equal to um, A squared uh, plus b squared. Uh, so this is the, the relationship of the Pythagorean theorem uh, between uh, all these three sides. And so uh, we can then shuffle this around in order to figure out the length of c. And so we can just copy this. Um, and so if we take the square root of both sides, we cancel out the, um, the power of 2 here. So we're going to delete that. I'll move that over, and then, then magically, we now have a, a square root of of this, and and that's how that's how you can get the length of a vector. I I I I'm bad at organizing this layout. I'm sorry. Okay. 
Um, and so in our case, uh, we have a very similar situation, right? Again, if we want to know the length of a vector, the vector has x components and y components. Um, so this vector b minus a, if we draw it from the origin, we're going to have something like this, right? Um, and so this too will form a triangle. The, the triangle will have the side lengths of x, in this case 4, and y, in this case, negative 1. And so really what we're looking for to get the length of a vector is we're doing x squared plus um, y squared gives us the length of a vector, where x and y is the components of the vector. Um, again, the, the components of a vector would simply be x and y. So that gives us the length. Um, do I need more space? Oh no. Um, was this lecture till 12? Uh, yes. Because then we have lunch and then everyone except Stockholm has a retrospective thing after lunch. Uh, so I'm going to give you an assignment to work on. OK, so this is how we can figure out the length of a vector. Um, OK, and this is sometimes also called magnitude of a vector. So you're going to find those words used uh, interchangeably. Uh, so it's also known as magnitude. All right. So now that we know the, the magnitude or, or length of a vector, uh, we can then we can then figure out the uh, distance between two points. So you kind of always start with length as your your starting point. Um, again, the same thing we did with numbers. The absolute value gives you the length of uh, the length of a number. So negative six has a length of six. Um, and then using the concept of the absolute value or the magnitude. Um, we can then get the difference between two numbers and then get the magnitude of that difference. And that is what distance is. And so we can do the same thing for vectors. Um, so if we want to get the distance between two vectors, um, let's call them a and b. Um, so that is going to be the length of the difference between the two. And the difference is going to be b minus a. And then in order for us to get the length, uh, we have, there is a shortcut to uh, denote the magnitude, which is two vertical bars, like this. And so these two vertical bars means this. You, you get the, the length of the vector itself. Um, and so that's, that's what those two vertical bars mean. And you can probably see that there's a very, very striking similarity between just numbers and vectors. Um, because you're effectively doing the same thing, except the, the distance calculation is a little bit different. Um, but you could use the, uh, the same structure as the Pythagorean theorem, even for the one-dimensional case. Uh, let me just move these. Oops. 
Okay. Did that make sense? Or was that a bunch of gibberish? <laughs> Okay, so that, that is the distance between A and B. Oh yeah, this this is flipped. It's flipped. Oh no, literally unplayable. See? It's easy to mix it up. It happened in real time. Um Yeah, Adam, I think that was the issue, right? Because I had it flipped. Oh yeah, and it should land somewhere else, not at four, because I didn't draw this to scale. So it should be... Um, go further than that. There we go. It's mostly for visual purposes. Don't, don't read into this too much, you know? Th there are flaws. <laughs> there we go. Um, okay, and so, uh, just making sure we got time. The, the next thing we might want to do after this um, is uh, check over the sign. Like, remember, we, we had a way to check the direction of where this was headed. Like, we can see what side of zero uh, each number is. Um, and for, uh, for just numbers, it's, it's a very straightforward way to figure that out. If it's greater than zero, the direction is one. If it's less than zero, the direction is negative one. If it's zero, then in math, we usually just define it as zero, even though that's not really a direction. Um, <clears throat> so, but, but in, in 2D, things get a little, little spicier than that. Um, I'm going to remove this now. Maybe I'll remove this too. Maybe, maybe we don't need this one anymore. It's refreshing to see me make mistakes. Yep. I don't make mistakes when I'm not streaming, I promise. I'm, I'm flawless whenever I'm not streaming. It's just because of the, the public pressure, you know? Um, okay. And so if we want to get the, the direction of a vector, then in this case, the answer is not just negative one or one, right? Um, like, sure, we can sort of do it per axis if we want to. But when we do this with uh, direction vectors, or when we want to get the direction of a vector, um, what we're really asking is, what is the vector that is pointing in the same direction as our original vector, but with a length of one? So around the origin here, we have a circle that passes through one, ideally, on all of the axes. This is a flawless picture. There we go. Um, and so this circle represents all vectors with a length of one, right? So no matter where we go on this circle, all of these vectors, the magnitude of them is exactly one. Um, and so again, if we do this equation, this length, on this circle, all of them is going to be exactly one. Uh, these vectors have a special name. Vectors that have a length of exactly one are called unit vectors. Sometimes they're called normalized vectors. Um, yeah, normalized vectors are unit vectors. And so this circle is called a unit circle. Um, and normalized vectors are very, very special. They're very useful 
and you're going to see them almost ubiquitous in many cases. Uh, normalized vectors are special because if they have a length of one, so let's say the length of this one is exactly one, if you multiply this vector by a number, let's say you multiply it by five, it's going to create a vector that is exactly five times as long. And so if you multiply it, you're going to basically stretch this one to become longer. And so this one would have a length of five if you multiply it by five. Um, and so normalized vectors are usually used to represent directions. Um, so quite often when you see the word direction, it's often implied that it has a length of one. Um, so if you're using something in Unity like transform direction, then that is going to imply that you're dealing with normalized vectors. And so, so normalized vectors are very, very common. You see them in many different places in game dev. Um, and so it might be useful, how do we get a normalized vector from an arbitrary vector? And effectively, what that is, is we're doing the same thing we did um, here with our numbers. If we want to get the direction, if it's um, positive or negative, we can take the value and divide it by the length of that value. And for vectors, it's ex exactly the same thing. So if we want to get the uh, direction of some vector, um, then the process of doing that is called normalization. Uh, so it's kind of the direction slash nor ajis. the normalized function. Um, of some vector a. It's hard to pick the correct brush size. Then we do the same thing. We take the vector a and we divide it by the length of a. And there we go. So this is exactly the same thing as for one dimensional numbers. We take the, the vector, divide it by the length of that vector, and what's gonna happen is that we get a unit vector out of it. So if we normalize this vector A, what's gonna end up happening is that we get this vector right here. And so this is a normalized. So vertical bars, uh, A. I need to add presets to, to select brush sizes, I feel like. Because it's always too thick or too thin. There you go, normalized A. That's the process of normalization. Um, so effectively, you're turning a an arbitrary vector to a um, arbitrary vector to a direction. Like, what is the direction of A? And then we normalize it, and we kind of get the, the direction vector, which is also known as a unit vector, because it has a length of 1. Uh, OK. Mm. Just checking for questions. Uh, it's okay to have a little bit of off-topic conversation, but just don't fill the entire page, especially if there's a question, then I don't want that question to disappear. Uh, okay. Mm. What would happen if you use a non-normalized vector for direction? Uh, a lot of assumptions will break. That's kind of the problem. There's, a, there's some other situations as well where normalized vectors matter, and we're going to get to that right after this. Um, okay, any questions so far? Did, did, did the concept of normalized vectors make sense? Non-normalized vectors will be used as a speedrun strat? Uh, I believe 
this is the basis for uh, bunny hopping in a lot of FPS games. Um, where there's a vector that isn't normalized and it's slightly off and therefore you can build up speed. Uh, distance AB didn't quite stick. Um, all right, so distance. Um, if we want to get the distance between the two points or vectors, we have a point A and a point B, and we're just drawing them as arrows. Um, then effectively what we're doing is that we're taking the vector between the two, this vector right here. So this is the difference between A and B. Uh, so in this case, this would be a minus b. Um, so we're taking that vector and getting the length of that vector, right? Um, that vector itself is b minus a or a minus b, and then it's going to point in the other direction, right? So now that we then have that vector, b minus a, um, we just need to get the length of that one in order to, um, in order to figure out the distance between a and b. So really what the problem boils down to is two problems. One, finding this vector, which is a minus b. Uh, and two, getting the length of that vector, which is the same length function we would use for any other vector, right? Um, and that is this length function right here, which is we're basically taking the components of the vector, the x-coordinate and the y-coordinate. Uh, we're squaring them, adding them up, and then taking the square root of that. And that gives us the uh, length of that vector. <clears throat> um, is there a term for a vector which fits inside a square instead of a circle? Uh, yes, that is, then you're using a different distance norm. Um, so if you want to read up on this, you can look up the concepts of, I think it's Chebyshev distance you're talking about. Um, so Chebyshev distance is a different type of distance norm. Uh, then we're not using this as our uh, way of measuring distances anymore. Uh, this is a special case called Euclidean distance. Um, so Chebyshev distance would be this square right here. Um, and that's used for stuff like if you're making a board game, <clears throat> then maybe you want the diagonals to count at, as uh, one. If, if you have a grid movement in a game, for instance, um, then maybe you want this distance to be one, right? Um, so that, that is what she Chebyshev distance is. Um, then you have another distance norm, which is kind of the, has a rhombus shape like this. And that's called taxi cab distance, which is kind of uh, going the other direction, where maybe you want this distance from here to here, maybe you want that to be a length of two. So that's kind of, it's called taxi cab, because if you imagine a, a bunch of buildings, then this would be the path you would take. Um, yeah, so that that's... You can use different distance norms, but the, the perfect circle is usually called Euclidean distance. <clears throat> can we get a spell here in chat? Um, Chebyshev distance. I think it's spelled like that. Or wait, actually, I think the second C is incorrect. There we go. If you look up distance norms on Wikipedia, um, then you'll, you'll find it if you want to jump down this rabbit hole. Uh, you can also interpolate between them smoothly if you want to, which is kind of neat. Um, if you want to have weird vector normalization. Okay, how are we doing on time? Uh, okay, five minute break. We're on our break now. Five minute break. Hell yeah, I got the spelling right. <laughs> yes. That proves I'm 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 a good teacher, right? It's all about memorization. It's not about anything else. Okay, five minute break. We're resuming in, well, a little bit past um, eleven. Is there a difference between distance and length? Uh, yes, the the length is the length of one vector. The distance requires two vectors. Um, so distance is from one vector to another, uh, while length is the length of a single vector. So it's kind of just a difference of the number of inputs, right? 
the length of a vector is usually, I'm going to change this now to make this less confusing. So if you want to get the length of a vector a, because I kind of should have probably written this in vector notation. Actually, we're going to do the opposite. Um, We're still on break, by the way. So if you want to go get coffee or tea or whatever, then this I'm I'm just I'm just keeping on teaching during the break because apparently that's 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 how, how I do. Okay, so so really what we're doing here, we're taking the a dot x or the x component of a, which you would usually do a dot x, and then we're doing. Um, ah, geez, this is a little messy. I apologize. And then a dot y. There we go. This is this is how we would write it in code, uh, because you usually get the components using dot, using the dot notation like this. I hate the tablet interactions with. Where is this? Um. Goodness, the kids outside are screaming so much. I don't understand why. It's just incessant screaming. Why? There we go. Now we have a sort of sort of proper proper way of writing this for code. <laughs> um, <clears throat> uh, when I try the square root of oh yeah, so so like uh, Joe Bins is saying. Um, yeah, so, so when you do the square root of a number, um, then negative numbers kind of automatically turn positive as well. Um, specifically when squaring it. If you're cubing it, then it's going to keep the sign. Yes, that's the that's the issue Adam had, I presume. So if you take five squared is twenty five. Negative five squared is negative twenty five. And negative five squared is 25 because it's a negative 5 times negative 5 in that case uh, so the signs cancel out Did that make sense, Adam? Apologies for my bad fives. These are very, very ugly numbers. I'm I'm not good at writing writing at all. Uh, 
Okay. We're still on break, by the way. I'm just... Or maybe we should end the break very soon. <laughs> um... Wait, I lost the channel. There we go. Okay. There are so many future games discards. Sorry. We have cats. Where where where's my button? There he is. It's Thor. Hello. Hello, Thor. He's thinking. Okay, did the did the thing about the square or the, the squaring make sense with negative numbers? He's just sitting there, very pristinely. What would the length of that vector from A to B be? Um, we can do that if you want. Thoroughly unimpressed cat, yeah. Um, he's not impressed by y'all, or maybe he's not impressed by me. It's, it's either of the two. Oh, he got curious about something. Hey. Blink. Um. Sorry, I have a bit of a weird streaming setup right now. Maybe I'll keep the camera on Thor. <clears throat> Um, okay, so what would it be? That was the question. Um, so, uh, we would need to get the vector between these two, right? So, if we're doing, um, let's see, we're doing A minus B. Ow, ow, ow! Thor! Buddy! Buddy! Okay, so if we're getting the, if we want to get the difference between A and B, we need to figure out the value of that vector first. Um, so let's figure that out. If we have, let's see, so the x component of A is 3, x component of B is 2. <clears throat> so we're doing uh, 3, um, 3 minus negative 2, so that's the same as 3 plus 2. Uh, so we're going to get uh, 5 for our x component. Um, and then for the y component, uh, let's see, so that is a's y component is 1, and then b has a y component of, um, or a height, sorry, I should, I should draw it in green. Uh, b is 2, so we're doing 1 minus 2, so that's negative 1. Um, so, so this is a minus b. And then we want to get the length of this. Um, so again, that would be the square root of um, our left. So. so we would do 5 um, squared uh, plus uh, negative 1 squared. Okay, and so we just need to calculate that, and so, so what would that be? That's the square root of uh, 25, I forgot how to draw, draw 2, 25 plus, so negative 1 squared is 1. Um, there we go. So it's a square root of 26.
and that, that's 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 the length of that vector. I don't know what the square root of 26 is. So we're firing up the calculator. So the 26, uh, I never used this before. Is it that one? There we go, that's our answer. <laughs> Uh. Okay, did that make sense? Okay, cool. Um, all right. Getting getting a little messy with all of these scribbles. Okay, so we only have an hour left. Um, <clears throat> I also need to make sure we're no longer on the break. React, please. There we go. React if you're present, because we're no longer on break. Important stuff coming. Now we're going to talk about stuff that's going to be central to your your first assignment. Um, okay, cool. You're all here. So, um, let's see which layer is this on? That one. Gonna scoot this out of the way. I'm gonna copy these. Very useful little coordinate system. Okay. Um so we've talked about the uh, we've talked about adding vectors. We've talked about uh, getting the length of vectors. We talked about getting the distance between two vectors, and how to normalize vectors. Um, so we have adding, subtracting, and then also multiplying by a scalar. So, ow, 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 Thor, Thor, <laughs> ow. Okay, um, and so if you ow. This boy, go, go eat. Okay, so if you have a vector, then, uh, sorry, I got so sidetracked by Thor poking me. Um, so if you have a vector V and you want to add it to another vector, let's do A and B again. Uh, so adding vectors is pretty straightforward. We have a vector of A, a vector of B, and then really all we're doing is we're taking the X and Y components and adding them separately. Uh, and the same thing goes for a subtraction. Like vector subtraction works very similarly. You just do A minus B, and then you just do it per component. Uh, the same thing goes for uh, scalar multiplication and division. So if you have a out or, um, and so if you have, oh, Jesus Christ. Okay, I'm gonna give you the Thor cam so you can see what's going on. Ow, hey, buddy. I'm trying to teach math here. Okay, if, if you have a vector, um, A, and then you multiply it by some scalar, 
So not a vector. Um, ow. So if you multiply it by a scalar, um, let's call it S. Um, so again, scalar is just a number. It's not a vector. Then we also do it component-wise. Um, so A times S, in this case, um, is going to be the, the X component of A uh, times S. And then you would have the uh, Y component times S. And then you just, you just do it per component as well. Um, and the same thing goes for division. You can do the same with division. But weird things start to happen when we start asking the question of what is A multiplied by B? Um, and so the symbol we're using here matters a lot. So usually in math, you, don't, you omit the symbol if it's multiplication. So, so AB should be A multiplied by B. Uh, but this is an operation that has many answers. Uh, there are many different ways of multiplying vectors. I'm like gesturing with my hands, even though the camera is not even on, on me. Um, so multiplying vectors is something that is usually not defined as a single straight up multiplication. Um, I'm not going to get into too much about why that is, because it gets complicated. Uh, but so generally, when we multiply vectors, uh, we have different, a few different ways of doing it. And so this is where you might have heard of the dot product. And you might have also heard of the cross product. So these are kind of the, the two most common ways of multiplying vectors. Um, so let's talk about the dot product. Um, so the dot product, you usually write with a dot, which kind of kind of makes sense. It's in the name. Um, th this cat. Ow. Um, so the dot product uh, between two two vectors, we have a, um, and then a dot. B. So that is the, the dot product. Um, so let's let's talk about the dot product. Um, need more space. Okay. I should write it out. Somehow it's really, really hard to focus when you have a cat poking, poking your arm consistently. Okay, the dot product. This is a very special operation and it's very, very important. Um, So what is the dot product? The, the dot product is used in many different cases. And depending on what type of vectors you use it with, it basically tells you different information about those vectors. Um, and so uh, the dot product is also known as the scalar product. Uh, it is also known as the symmetric product. Uh, sometimes also known as the interior product. It has many names, but generally people are going to be calling it the dot product. Um, okay, so what, what does the dot product do? Um, well, first we can, we can write it out algebraically. Um, so the way you calculate the dot product, um, so we got a dot equals okay so the dot product 
To calculate this, you do a um, dot x, so the x component of a, uh, and then you multiply that by the x component of b, and then you add the y component of a multiplied by the y component of b. Um, so this is how the dot product is defined for, for 2D vectors. It's the, the pattern is the same for any number of dimensions, uh, but this is the, the definition of the dot product. Um, and so you basically just take the x components, multiply them together, take the y components, multiply those together, and add them all up. Um, and so there are a few things you might notice just looking at this. Uh, for one, the dot product between two vectors is not a vector in and of itself. Uh, because again, this, this is just a number. Like the x components multiplied by each other is a number. The y components multiplied by each other is also just a number. So it's just a number plus a number, right? So this might turn out to be like, you know, five plus eight. Um, and then the dot product is just a number. And this is why it's often called a scalar product, because you're taking two vectors, but the result is a scalar, not a vector. And again, scalar is just a different name for numbers, right? Um, OK, so this is how, how you write the, the dot, dot product algebraically. But then the question remains, like, what is the point of this? What, is, what, is, what does this number represent? Um, and so that is kind of the, the most important part of the dot product. Like, what's it useful for? Um, so there are two, two primary use cases and a third one that's a little bit more weird. Um, so the first one is if, the, if A is normalized, um, so a way to write normalized vectors or unit vectors is to put a little hat on top of it like this. Um, so this means that the length of A is one. So whatever A is, we normalize it and set the length to one. Um, if we do the dot product between a normalized vector and a non-normalized vector, uh, we get a special case of the dot product called scalar projection. Um, Okay, so scalar projection is a special case of the dot product where one of the vectors is normalized. So what does that mean? Well, what is, what is scalar projection? Well, let's draw our vectors. So again, normalized vectors uh, have to live on the unit circle. So I'm attempting to draw a circle one day. There we go, close enough, right? Um, So a normalized vector, that's going to be our A. So we, we draw some, some vector here. So this is A, but normalized. So we're going to do A hat. OK, so far so good, right? And then we need our vector B. And B can be any vector. We can draw it wherever we want. So let's, let's draw it uh, over here. So maybe this is our vector B. <clears throat> so the scalar projection between these two vectors is a single number. And that number represents, let's see, just, just extending the direction of this one, just for visualization purposes. Um, that number represents how far along A is B. And so what, what it's really representing, um, so if you imagine projecting B onto this line, 
So we're taking this coordinate and kind of flattening it against the line of A. Uh, then what the scalar projection gives us is the signed distance of B along this line right here. So it gives us that distance. So again, this is A, A hat uh, B. It's a dot product between those two. And so that's what the dot product gives us. So it gives us a single number representing where is B along this, this direction, right? Um, and so in this case, the number, we can sort of measure the distance and kind of eyeball it. And we can see that in this case, it's probably this, this length is probably a little bit more than three, right? If we rotate this down, we can probably imagine it's like, I don't know, three point something, right? Um, this is one of the situations we don't want abs the distance since we need it signed. Uh, it depends on the use case for your scalar projection. You can use abs if you want to. It depends on what you're doing with it, right? Um, but like you say, we, we can do this using negative uh, numbers too. So instead of using um, instead of using b here, we can use a different value. Use a different value for b. Um, so if we instead use, I don't know how to get thickness right. Okay, so if we instead use this vector, for instance, so let's say this is our new value of b. Um, then again, we can extend the direction of this one, but we're extending it to the to infinity, both forwards and backwards. Um, so that's A. And then what the scalar projection does, it's kind of in the name, projection. We're taking the, the, the value or the, the vector B and projecting it onto the infinite line that the direction A um, represents. So again, it's a 90 degree angle there. And then the result of the dot product is going to be the signed distance along this short line here. So this is going to be um, a hat dot b. And in this case, it's going to be a negative number because now it's on the uh, backside of a. It's no longer in front of a, it's now behind a. Um, and so scalar projection is used a lot when you want to figure out the relationship between two vectors. Um, and so in this case, if you want to know, is an object in front of or behind some other object, you can use the dot product directly. Um, maybe A is the, again, we can use the direction of, of a car that's driving or something. Uh, so a car is driving along in that direction. Um, and then you want to figure out, is something in front of or behind you, uh, then maybe it's some, some object or whatever. If this, the dot product between the direction of the car and the vector to the object itself, if it's negative, it's behind the car. If it's positive, it's in front of the car. Uh, and so, so this is something that the dot product is used for all the time, when you want to know is something in front of something or behind something. Um, so you're finding the shortest possible distance between the B point and the A vector. Um, well, it's the shortest distance of B projected onto the infinite line of A. Um, and that distance can be negative, so it's a signed distance. Um, so it's either negative if it's behind A, or it's positive if it's in front of A. Okay. Mm. Did that make sense? Lots of people typing. exactly your use case in your game project. Oh, well, there you go. 
You can just do, do some scalar projection. So it's essentially figuring out if something is in front or behind something else. Uh, yes, and not only that, it also gives you how far in front of or how far behind it is. Um, so again, we can use our car example. We have the direction of a car and then maybe we have maybe we have a different car. Maybe it's a racing game. And you want to know how far in front of the red car is this car. Uh, then we take the vector from your car to this car, and then we project it onto the direction that you're moving. And then what we end up getting is how far ahead that other car is. And that's the dot product between um, the A normalized um, and B. And again, if this is um, if this value is a negative, it's behind. If it's positive, it's in front. Um, in fact, if if the if it's not normalized, uh, that rule still holds. Um, if it's not normalized, then if it's positive, it's in front. If it's zero, it's exactly perpendicular, and if it's negative, it's behind it. But you won't get actual distance values unless w at least one of them is normalized. Um, so the normalization is required if you care about the specific distance here. Um, but if you, if you omit the normalization, then you can no longer rely on that distance, uh, but you can still check the sign if it's positive or negative or zero. Um, so, so the dot products without normalizing one of them can still be used uh, for that. Uh, can you write out the value we get? Um, it's a little bit complicated because we have a normalized vector, and so it's going to be a decimal point thing. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit messy, uh, but we can do it in code if you want to, if that helps. We can open Unity and try it out. Um, could it be used, for example, for a stealth mechanic where an AI only notices a player if the dot product is positive? Uh, yeah, you can do that. Uh, the dot product in general is also used to get the angle between two vectors, uh, but we're going to get into that when we get into uh, trigonometry. Uh, so would we use the position of the car plus its forward vector? Um, you would use the forward vector of the car, that's A, and then you would use the vector from your car to the other car, right? Which would be, well, your, um, it would be, Shit, I forget the direction. Other car, other car position minus your car position would give you this blue vector B, right? Uh, did you apply A102? Uh, we're going to get into that during trigonometry, but not, not yet. Uh, we don't have time for trigonometry today. I wanted to, but we have to cut it short because you have a different class. Uh, actually, no. Trigonometry is for was supposed to be for next day. Uh, not not today. <clears throat> um, okay. Did that make sense in terms of what scalar projection is? And again, it's called scalar projection because it just gives you a number. It doesn't give you a vector. It just gives you a signed distance along some other vector. Okay. Um, I hate how we're short on time. I wanted to go through more than this. Um, I also need to sneeze. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, if I understood correctly, scalar gives you two objects a distance and relative position to each other. Uh, yes, it's the projected distance along a given direction, right? So yeah, it's the, the signed distance along this. So you can imagine taking the, the vector B, flattening it against the direction of the other one, and then getting the, the signed length of that. 
Uh, if it's a normalized vector, will the answer always be between negative one and one? Uh, yes. If both vectors are normalized, um, then you get, uh, then the, the, it's always between negative one and one. Um, and so, um, drawing a quick, quick circle. Uh, so if both of them are normalized, it means both of them have a length of one. Um, so in that case, the, um, the dot product between these two, um, kind of represents how similar these two vectors are. Um, so if you imagine the, um, these vectors pointing in the same direction, uh, the dot product would have a value of one. Um, if the dot product, or if, if the other one is pointing perpendicular to each other, uh, you would have a value of zero. Um, if it's pointing exactly opposite, then it would have a value of negative one. Um, and then I guess we should go full circle, because why not? Um, so this would be zero. And if they're pointing exactly in the same direction, um, it would be one. Um, and so if both of them are normalized, you can kind of use this as a substitute to get the angle between two vectors. Um, the, the scalar, the, the dot product doesn't exactly represent the angle. Um, the, you still have to do another step in between. Uh, you're going to need the arc cosine, uh, which we're going to talk about later. Um, but if you do the arc cosine of a dot b, uh, then you get the uh, angle between the two vectors, if both of them are normalized. So again, we should put some hats on this. Uh, but we haven't talked about trigonometry yet, so this is spoilers. You didn't see this. This is hidden. Uh, so imagine this is not there. Okay. Um, have you used the dot product before to figure out where an attack was coming from relative to a shield and if a shield could block it? Uh, yes, that is a common use case. Um, a, another use case that is pretty similar to the one you just mentioned. Um, I was implementing sound for a game. Um, so let's say you have some surface. Um, and let's say you have an object that is uh, falling down. Maybe it's a, it's a ball and it's hitting the ground. Uh, and then you want to play an audio clip. Um, so you have, have some audio source. And, but, but then the question is, how, how loud should this be? Um, well, we have some intuition that, like, if this is moving very quickly, it should be louder, right? But we, maybe we want to make a distinction between this one hitting almost straight on versus a ball that is hitting here, right? Like, clearly, this one should be louder than this one because this one is, is kind of a shallow angle, right? Uh, it's not as hard of an impact, whereas if, if this ball is hitting here, or maybe we can do it even straight on like this, uh, then obviously this should be louder of an impact than this. Or maybe we even want to use different sounds depending on the, the shallowness of the angle, right? And this is a use case for the dot product, uh, because really what, what we want is have some variance depending on the angle and magnitude that it hits something. Um, so what we're really looking for here is that we have the velocity of the object itself, right? Let's call that V. And then we have the direction of the surface. You can sort of imagine, uh, this is called a normal vector. Uh, that's a vector pointing directly out from the surface. So, uh, so these would be normal vectors and normal vectors are almost always normalized as well. Uh, so these are normals. And so if you then do the dot product between the normal and the velocity, then you end up projecting it and you, you're getting this signed distance here. Now it's going to be negative, um, but if you negate it, then you get basically a value that can pretty accurately represent how loud that sound should be. Uh, because as soon as you have a shallow angle, like you can imagine an, a vector pointing like this, then the the magnitude is going to be much much smaller right you can see that that this value is much much bigger 
uh, this is bigger, this is smaller. Um, and so, so that was like one use case for the dot product of like, you have the velocity of some, some objects and you have the normal of the surface and the dot product between those two can be used to determine how loud uh, that sound should be. Um, uh, does vector three not project on plain use dot products then? Uh, almost certainly, yes. I haven't looked into their source code, but I'd be surprised if they didn't. Um, so this is an actual use case I've had in, in my game. Um, there are many, 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 many different use cases for the dot products. So if you want, I can just have a grand bag of use cases. <laughs> um, Okay. Um, does Dark Souls use the dot product to check for backstabs? Probably. Um, again, it's all about the relationship between directions. That is what the, the dot product is used for. Um, you can use angles as well if you want, but it's usually a bit more costly to compute. And so you can quite often get away with not calculating the angle. Uh, but for one-off things like that, if you're doing a backstab thing, then checking the angle is not going to be, um, it's not going to be that expensive. It's not like you're running it every frame anyway. So you can call it a freeze frame if it's very, very um, taxing on your computer. Um, okay, let's see. We have 20 minutes left. Okay. Um, Ooh, it's a little, little bit tight. Um, but I think, I think we have time. Um, okay, maybe we should jump into Unity. Um, and I can show you a little bit how I usually work with Unity to do math things like this. Um, and then, I will give you assignments. How does that sound? Um, how, how angry will you all be if I go a little bit above or beyond uh, or, or like overlapping lunch a little bit? Is that okay? Uh, oh, I haven't seen this interface before. I don't know, 3D, I think. Mm. Well, I know the folder doesn't exist. I wanted you to create it. Jeez. I'd rather the lecture end at a good point than end early. Okay. I just don't know if you have any, like, um, if you have any things you need to head off to. Oh God, what is this layout? Wait, why did it start Unity 2020? Gross. Why did it pick that? Yes, I want to upgrade. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'll try not to uh, override lunch too much. Okay, this layout is trash garbage, so I'm just gonna Shuffle this around. Um, okay, beautiful. Um, okay, one thing I like to do in my Unity project uh, when I'm doing like math things 
is I delete the light source and then I go to the, where is it? Lighting tab. And then I delete the skybox and then we, we go into 2D mode because that's a little bit more comfy. And then we have a nice grid and then we delete the camera. We don't need cameras. There we go. We don't need anything. We just need an empty game object. Uh, you've used Unity before, right? I don't need to cover how to use Unity, I'm guessing. Uh, I removed everything in the scene and in the lighting tab, I removed the skybox. There's a material assigned for the skybox, so I just deleted that. Okay, so one place I really like um, experimenting with math and testing things uh, is in the gizmo drawing uh, in components. So I'm just going to create a new script. Um, I'm going to give it a very descriptive name of math thing. I trust this. Come on, writer. Process a little faster. Okay, so um, I actually forgot what example we were gonna do. Uh, I guess we can just talk about some of the things we we've already covered when it comes to distances and whatnot, just to implement it in practice. Um, so I usually like doing stuff like this in a function called on draw gizmos. Uh, on draw gizmos will be called in the editor. So you don't have to press play. It will just work. Um, and this will draw in the scene view, which is kind of nice. Um, so in here you have a lot of functions in unity, uh, in gizmos dot draw, whatever. So maybe you want to draw a line from two points. Uh, or maybe uh, you want to draw a cube, or maybe you want to draw a sphere, and so forth. Um, so maybe we can do draw a sphere at transform dot um, position with a radius of one. Um, so this is not Unity. This is Photoshop. Uh, so now you can see we have a very low poly sphere that is being drawn at the position of this game object. And this is super useful for doing debugging stuff. And, and especially for testing your code to see if it works. Um, and so, so maybe we can do an example of the dot product. So let's, let's create two more objects. Um, we're creating A and B. Um, let's give it some labels. It's visible, right? You can see the, yeah. Okay. I think that should be visible. Um, just not sure about resolution and stuff. Um, okay. So now we have two game objects, A and B. And then we want to do some math with them. So we need a reference to them in our script. So they are transforms. Did we go through cross product tomorrow? Uh, yes. Yeah, a lot of these things we've talked about translate to 3D as well. Uh, but the cross product is unique to 3D. Um, there's not really a cross product in 2D. There kind of is, but that's goes beyond the scope of what we're going to talk about. <laughs> um, okay, so we have two, two transforms, A and B. I'm just going to drag the references. Um, we're going to stop drawing the sphere. And then we have our two, two vectors. We have a, a coordinate of A, which is going to be A dot 
uh, position. Then we do the same thing for B. So now we're kind of in our in our usual math situation. Um, so maybe we can draw those vectors. So we draw a line from. Uh, if we want to draw a vector, we want to draw it from zero. So I'm just going to do defaults to A and defaults to B. I don't think there's a color parameter, right? Okay. What? Uh, I think cyan is going to be more visible. Um, okay, so this should draw two lines just from zero to um, A and B. Hopefully they're visible. They might be a little thin on stream after compression and everything. Okay. Hopefully that's visible. Um, and so now th this allows us to kind of experiment with our math and kind of test it in a very isolated case. Uh, sometimes when you're writing like math heavy functions, it's very, very, very useful to uh, not test them in the context of your game because usually there's a lot of like other variables that interfere uh, with trying to figure out how things work. And so it can be very useful to like work with these things in isolation. Um, Okay, so, so what are the things we, we've been talking about? So let's try normalizing. Um, so maybe we want to normalize A. Like, what would that look like? Um, so, uh, so let's call this A normalized. And then we want to do, we want to take the vector A and then divide by the length of A, right? Now, there are many like built-in functions to do these things. Like you don't always have to write out the math yourself. Um, so what we talked about earlier, uh, doing it like manually, uh, then it, we would do the Pythagorean theorem, like straight up. So the square root of um, a dot x times a dot x plus um, a dot y uh, times a dot y. Uh, so we're just squaring here, right? Uh, or this is the length, sorry. Um, so that's a length of A, right? Uh, now, we can also just use the built-in functions here, right? Um, we can calculate the length uh, using just A dot magnitude. Uh, that basically does the same thing. Uh, so you can use whichever one you want. Um, but this one is going to be slightly faster. If you're doing very performance-sensitive code, um, it's, it can be useful to write things out like this uh, because magnitude has like an extra overhead when calling uh, the property. Uh, but generally, in most cases, you would just call magnitude because it's way more readable, right? Uh, but it's good to keep in mind like what the underlying math is sometimes. Um, okay, so this gives us the length of A. And then if we want to normalize A, we can do A divided by the length of A. Um, or we can just do a dot normalized. Uh, so this will also give you the normalized version of a. Um, so this is kind of the manual version. Um, well, either of these two. Or the quick and easy version. Generally, again, generally you would use the quick and easy version, but now you know how these work, like under the hood, right? Um, Okay, and then we can draw this one. So let's let's draw um, let's draw a sphere at the tip of the normalized vector. Uh, we're gonna do something like that, and we want to color it by a as well. <coughs> can we just create a magnitude extension method returning the more performant one? Uh, no, because then you have the overhead again. Uh, the overhead is is in the fact that you're calling a method, uh, and so it's it's going to be about the same. Um, um, okay, so now we should be drawing the normalized version of a, um, and so here we're drawing a dot at the normalized version of a, and you can see that no matter what length we set a to, um, the normalized version always has a length of one. Uh, and you can see that it's, it's sticking to the unit circle, right? <clears throat> um, 
Um, one point of optimization, ask how often it needs to be called and call it just as often as that. Yeah. Yeah, the, um, again, it's mostly if you're doing like very performance sensitive code, if you're iterating through like 500 things and you want to get the distance or the length of 500 vector vectors, then then maybe it's, it's a good idea to write the math out explicitly and not call a bunch of methods. Um, but it really depends on use cases. Okay, so now we have the, the normalized version of A. Um, can make it a little bit tinier because it's a very large blob. <clears throat> um, and then for the scalar product of normalized dot B, was it zero when B was perpendicular to A and negative one when it was behind? Yes, a negative one if it's exactly behind if both of them are normalized. Um, the dot product is always negative if it's behind, it's always positive if it's in front of, it's always zero if it's exactly perpendicular. Um, but both of the vectors have to be normalized for it to be guaranteed one and negative one when they're either pointing in the same direction or opposite. Um, okay, uh, so let's let's do the let's do the dot product. Um, so um, I don't know if I should keep these if you want the code afterwards. I don't know what you, I don't know what you prefer. Um, all right, so we have a normalized vector and a non-normalized vector. So now we can, we can look at the dot product. Um, so let's do a scalar projection between these two. Um, so if, if we then take the dot product, so that's in vector two dot dot, that's the dot product. Um, then you pass the vectors in there. So we have the normalized A, uh, and then you have B, and this gives us the scalar projection. Now this is just a number. Um, I don't really know how we want to display it. We could just show it in the inspector um, or something. Um, actually, we should probably just name that after the variable itself. Okay. So now if we move these around, it might be very hard to read this number, but you can probably at least see that it's changing, right? Um, so it's positive on this side. Um, so in this case, it's, it's 1.5 when it's pointing along the same direction as B. Um, and then it's negative 1.5 pointing in the other direction. And if it's perpendicular, it's gonna get closer and closer to zero. Uh, and if it's exactly perpendicular, it's exactly zero. But because floating point coordinates work the way they do, you don't always get exactly zero. Um, why is it negative 1.5 and not negative one? Uh, that's because B is not normalized. So we're doing the dot product between the normalized A and the non-normalized B. Um, so the value is gonna depend on the length of B right now. And so that's why it's gonna differ like that. Um, yeah. So when one of the numbers is not normalized, we get the dot product with a multiplier. Yep, yeah, exactly. So, so the, the geometric interpretation of projecting onto the line only works if one of them, them is normalized, uh, or at least one of them is normalized. Uh, if none of them are normalized, um, it's kind of like projecting and then scaling by their lengths. Um, which is a little bit different. Um, and so you need to be careful about uh, how you use it. So in order for it to be scalar projection, at least one of them has to be normalized. And so that that's what we're doing right now. Um, then there's a, another, um, there's another way we can use the dot product. Um, and so the, the, the name scalar projection might, you know, hint that perhaps there's a vector projection and, and damn, there is. 
imagine that. So we're gonna we're gonna do vector projection as well. Okay, vector projection is slightly different. There is there's one important difference. So instead of just doing the normalized a dot b, we're also going to multiply that by normalized a. And so now with vector projection, the result is no longer a scalar. This time it's a vector. And this vector gives you the point at which it was projected to. So now it's not just a distance anymore, now it's a point. And so if we use a, a different vector that makes it a little bit more readable, so if this is B, and then we project it onto here, um, this point right here, the vector from, from zero to that point is the vector projection. Um, yeah, and so that would be this right here. That point is um, the dot product between A normalized gives us the uh, signed distance along it. And then if we multiply this normalized vector by that signed distance, which is what we're doing here, um, we get that vector pointing um, exactly at the point it was projected at. And so that's vector projection. And so it's very similar. You just multiply it by the vector that's normalized, and then you get the point here. Um, and so that's vector projection. And this is also super useful if you want to actually get the coordinates where this projection would happen to or happen at. So if you want to project something to a plane and you want to get that location or put something there, then, then you can use vector projection to get that coordinates, uh, coordinate out of it. Um, and so let's implement that. Um, vector projection. Um, and all we need to do here is we're taking our, um, let's call this the projected points. Uh, or actually, we should probably follow the same convention. Vector projection is going to be uh, the A normalized multiplied by the scalar projection. And then we should probably draw it. Um, there we go. That's not unity. Okay, so now if you move B, you can see that we have the projection onto the line of A. And so, so now, there, there, there we go. It projects onto this, no matter what the orientation is, uh, we get the perpendicular projection onto the, the infinite line that A represents. What's a use case for this? Um, let's see. Um, one very good use case is going to be your assignment. So I don't want to spoil that. Um, shit, I need to think about something else. That's like a really important use case too. Um, well, any any time you want to flatten something against something else, you know, um, it can be used to. I know that's a bad example. Actually, can't think of any any good examples right off the bat. Um, Find the distance between player and ground. Yeah, the problem with that is that you're gonna. Um, the problem with that is that that's distance, not the vector projection, um, and that usually you would just use the components, right, of the vector. Um, go up slopes. Um, yeah, you could use that. Um, I mean, it, it's a type of snapping, right? Like if you're if you're close to yeah, like a slope in a two D game. Um, and you want to make sure that you're actually sticking to the slope, 
maybe you're going to be slightly off and you want to snap it to, to hit the actual slope. Um, place a target marker for where a bomb should land. Um, that could work too, yeah. Assuming the you can approximate your terrain using just a line. Um, the um, Actually, we had the, the racing game, right? Like, you, you could use the, the scalar projection to figure out how far ahead a car is. Um, and you, if you want to draw some sort of marker where that is, maybe you want to draw a little dot for like, ooh, this car is about this far ahead of you or whatever, then you can use the vector projection to get this point, right? Um, yeah, a lot of, anytime you want to flatten something against a line, right? Okay, uh, I'm guessing we don't have a whole lot of time left. No, we do not. Okay, time for assignments. Um, okay, I'm gonna try to try to be quick. Um, mm, okay, I think I think the same assignments from last time is good. I think we actually caught up with what I wanted to have as assignments. Okay. Um, so let's, I'm going to give you two assignments, uh, and a third one that's a special assignment. <laughs> um, okay. All right. I don't know if I should have a separate document for the assignments, but all right. So the first assignment, let's do assignment one. There we go. What a number. Let's color code them. Um, or no, actually, we're going to do three assignments and then a special fourth one. Or no, wait, you don't have a whole lot of time to work on this. I guess Stockholm does. Um, I don't want you to like stay up super late because you have lectures tomorrow. Um, all right, the first assignment is to create a radial trigger. So when I mean create, I mean code, implement it in Unity uh, to create a trigger where maybe you have some, let's say it's a game where you have an explosive barrel. This is this is a dangerous danger barrel. Um, you don't want to go too close to this one. It's a, that's a flame. Um, so I want you to create a radial trigger where there's a radius around an object where you need to detect if something is inside or outside. Um, so maybe you have a, a player character and you need to detect if they're on the inside of the explosion radius of this barrel or not. So just doing a simple detection, uh, are we inside or outside? Um, that is the, the first, first assignment. Okay. Guessing that's pretty straightforward and clear what that means. Um, okay, and then the second assignment. Um, the second assignment is to create a, let's see, Okay, bouncing laser. Oh, and for the radial trigger, you're not allowed to use colliders. Uh, this is specifically a math exercise, so I want you to do dis distance measurements to figure out if you're inside or outside, right? 
Um, I want you to make a bouncing laser. Um, and so, if you, you can create some sort of terrain in Unity. Um, I don't really care how you create it, as long as you have some sort of colliders in your scene that is terrain. Uh, you can just create a bunch of like Unity primitives or whatever, whatever, whatever kind of shape you want to make for your. I'm just imagine like a worm scheme or something. Um, whatever you want to use, you can just slap in a bunch of like cubes and spheres or whatever. But I want you to create a bouncing laser where you can use Unity's raycasts to do this, where you start from some point. And then you raycast, and then I want you to do the math to create bounces. So if you raycast against here, I want you to make that bounce. And then I want you to code it so that it bounces, um, well, however many times you want. It would be nice if it's configurable, so you can set how many times it should bounce. And so this, this is the bouncing laser assignment. Um, for this one, you are not allowed to use Unity's reflect function. Uh, this is an exercise in figuring out how to write your own reflect function. So I want you to figure out how to do this reflection using only what we've talked about today. So you're not allowed to use uh, Unity's uh, reflect function. How do we calculate the bounce? That is what the assignment is, so I'm not going to tell you the answer to that. Uh, so I want you to try to figure that out on your own. So try to not give answers to everyone because the exercise is to figure it out. But again, I have given you all of the tools you need to figure that out. So everything I've talked about in this course uh, so far, you have those tools. Um, and so, so you're going to figure out how to do a bouncing laser. Um, you're not allowed to use vector3.reflect um, because that basically just solves the problem for you. And so the exercise is to, to build some intuition about using the tools we talked about. Um, Okay, I feel like we didn't talk much about the normals. Um, raycasting gives you the normal straight up. Um, so you can use Unity's raycast to get the normal. Um, and so that's, that's where you're going to need for this. Um, mm -mm. Are we supposed to do it in 2D or 3D? Um, whichever one you want. Um, the solution should look the same, regardless of which one you're using. Um, okay. I want to give you another one, but it feels mean to do it because you don't have a whole lot of time to work on this. Um, was this to be turned in? Um, I, I'm not going to double check to see if you've solved it or not. Um, again, it's just to make you... I want to give you the opportunity to exercise this and to build intuitions about how this works. Um, and so I'm not going to check your assignments uh, because I honestly don't have time because <laughs> there's a lot of students. Um, so yeah, um, we could do feedback sessions if you want to, uh, but it's probably not going to be during the lectures. It's probably going to be after. Um, and um, the second week, we could also do more interactive stuff like that if you want. Because again, the second week, I'm going to keep a little bit open so we can decide together what we want to do the um, second week. Um, OK. I think, I think, OK, so I think, I think the, the third one is going to be the bonus assignments. I wanted you to do this as a, as a non-bonus assignment, but I feel like we might be a little short on time. Um, and so for the last assignment, the bonus assignment. Um, okay. Um, it's basically going to be vector transformation. without using the built-in transformation functions. Again, it's a math exercise. Um, so for vector transformation, um, with dot product, it doesn't matter which vector is passed first. Uh, no, it doesn't. You can do it in any order. The result is the same. 
It matters only in cross product, right? Um, it matters in other products too, but yes, it does matter in the cross products. Uh, the cross product is anti-commutative, meaning that A times B is equal to negative B times A. Um, so that's the cross product. Okay, so this is the, the bonus assignment, and there, there are two parts to this. So let's say you have a coordinate, but not only do you have a coordinate, but you also have a space here, like a local space. And you can sort of imagine this being the, um, the directions of a transform in Unity. So this is transform.right, and then we have transform.up as well. So this is kind of like a game object, right? Um, and so what I want you to do, um, using these vectors, you can use transform.up and transform.write for this assignment, uh, but I want you to write a um, local to world function. Locat. In other words, you should be able to give a local coordinate, as in a coordinate that is relative to this space. And so maybe that coordinate is going to be here. And in local space coordinates, this would be represented using, um, in this case, like two on the x axis and one on the y axis. I want you to write a function to transform from local space to world space. So where is this in world space, given a local space coordinate? Um, and so the world space position of this one would be different. In world space, which is this coordinate system here, uh, it's going to be like 2, two point, I don't know, 6 on the x-axis. And on the y-axis, it's actually also 2.6-ish, 2.5. Uh, and so I want you to write a function that converts from a local space coordinate to a world space coordinate. Um, you're not allowed to use matrix multiplication for this because that, again, kind of solves your problem for you. Uh, we're going to get into that during our next lecture. Um, so in this case, I again, I want you to only use the tools that we've talked about during this class. You're not allowed to use the built-in transformation functions. You are allowed to use transform.write and transform.up if you want to. Um, and so that's that's local to world. Um, okay, and then finally, we have the special <laughs> the special um, bonus bonus thing. Uh, I don't understand, like a child coordinate? Yes. So this is like the, the coordinate of a child object of the one on the left. That, that is a local space coordinate, right? But I want you to write a function that can transform from local space to world space without using Unity's transformation functions. So effectively, I want you to write your own transformation function that doesn't make use of those helper functions. And you can do that using only the tools we've talked about today. Um, and so again, it's a math exercise. Don't take shortcuts, because that's, that's not going to make you learn, right? All right, and then 3b. This is the, this is the special, special edition. We're putting a star on that. I don't know. With scaling, too. Ignore scaling. Don't take scaling into account. Um, OK, so 3b. Uh, this is going to be world to local. So this is the opposite. Given a world space coordinate, so maybe we have a coordinate over here, uh, or here, let's say. So this is going to be a coordinate of uh, x-axis is 1, y-axis is 2. I want you to convert a world space coordinate into a local space coordinate. So local space, this vector would be different, right? It's a vector like this. Um, and so local space, it would be, I don't know, it would be like negative 0.5. And on the y-axis, it would be like 2. And there you go. And this is the bonus one. And what 
the what the bonus one means is that if you solve this one, if you solve 3b and 3a, um, I will put on cat ears for the next lecture. I have them somewhere here. Where are they? <laughs> so if you solve that, if any one of you solves it, then then you will you will be doing the the class a great service by having me wear cat ears during the next lecture. So so there you go. That's the that's the advanced assignment. Um, all right. I think we're we're running over time. Uh, I'm sorry for going a little bit too far. Um, I will send you this picture, and I will also send you the code. Um, yeah, are there any questions? How long do we have to do this? Uh, we only have until tomorrow, um, because we're doing a lecture tomorrow. So, um, yeah. And I know that some of you have other lectures during this, um, and so... And so some of you might not have that much time, but I hope you can find some time for it. And I hope your retrospective is not going to take too long. Um, yeah, uh, but I, I believe that is it for today. So I will send you, can I just send this straight up? I think so. Uh, there are no more lectures today. Uh, so there you go. That is the, my, my document. And then the script. Um, just adding some instructions, I guess. So this is the script. Oops. Uh, so we do not have a lecture on Thursday. I will give you assignments to work on whenever we don't have lectures. Uh, so you're always gonna have something to do. Um, so there you go, that's the code. Um, I hope that I think that's enough, right? Um, okay, yeah, sorry for overriding your lunch quite a bit. <laughs> um, but I really wanted to get to this point um, so that we can, you can do the, the assignments that I had planned. Um, again, do them in Unity. Uh, try not to take too many shortcuts. Try not to um, just get the answer because a lot of these things have very simple answers. Uh, but getting there is what I want you to go through. I want you to go through the process of solving the problem, of uh, figuring out what what do you have and what do you need to get to the result that you want. Again, it's a math exercise. Um, so if you look things up on the internet, they're just going to give you the answer and it's going to be too simple. Again, I want you to do the math and try to figure it out on your own. Um, yeah, okay. Um, I hope that wasn't too much and didn't override too far into your lunch. I will let you go, all of you people at Future Games. Um, I will stick around for a little bit longer for those of you who are on YouTube. I don't want to abandon you all completely. Um, yeah, but as for all of you at Future Games, uh, I'm letting you go. I, you're no longer stuck in, in my math class, uh, but, but thank you for 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 sticking around and not flooding the chat too much with memes. Um, but yeah, I hope this was useful. Uh, we will go through the assignments uh, tomorrow. Um, and so, so we're gonna spoil them immediately. So I, I recommend working on these today. Um, and yeah, that's, that's it. Thanks. Thanks, future game students. It's kind of weird to teach and not see all of y'all, but. Um, okay, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit longer, but the official Future Games 
section is 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 done because you all need to have lunch. Um, but now, in case people on YouTube have questions, then 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 feel free to shoot me questions now that I'm paying attention to you. Um. Next lecture is 9 a.m. CEST. Uh, yes. Tomorrow. I will put up a YouTube planned stream thing. It's going to be there. So, so you're going to find it on my channel. Oh, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, etc. So, so you should, you should do that. I have a lot of math videos on my channel. Um, also stuff about shaders and tools programming. So if you're into that kind of stuff, then, then you should, you should check out my channel, but I guess you're already on my channel. Um, I also have a discord server. If you want to, want to hang out in my community, um, then, then you, you can join Join there. There you go. That's a link. I don't even know if it's clickable. Do I need to include the HTTPS? Okay. There you go. If you want to join my Discord, you're welcome to join. We have a lot of game developers there. People who are interested in the shaders or math and so forth. Uh, yes. Uh, this will be... This will stay on YouTube. Don't worry about it. Um, a lot of people have been asking about that. <laughs> but yes, it will stay on YouTube. Um, Okay, uh, anyway, do you have any questions, YouTube folks? Small tip on Photoshop, if you hold shift, it'll draw a straight line. Uh, no, because I'm using a tablet and the pen pressure makes that not work. Uh, the problem is that when I press down the pen, I get low pressure. And so it's going to draw an extremely faint line. It works if you're using a mouse, but for a pen, it, it doesn't work because pen pressure is a thing, right? And so when I hold shift, yes, it will draw a straight line, but it's going to be basically invisible. So I can't use that. Um, I've gotten this <laughs> recommendation a lot. Been wanting to pin a message with the FAQ, but apparently that's not a thing mods can do. Uh, wait, is it possible to pin? Um, like, can I do that? Or oh yeah, there's been super chats. I think. How do I read the super chats? Uh. Uh. Pretty sure you can configure brush to always be hard, but I don't want to do that. I want it to have pressure in general, but not when drawing lines. And switching between types of brushes is annoying. Wait, how do I read super chats? Why is this hard? I feel like there has to be a way to just see all of the super chats. Now I feel bad because I was expecting this to be possible. Oh no. Oh no. Oh jeez, do I need to scroll the entire chat? Super chats are broken on YouTube? I don't think they're broken. It's just that they're temporary and I wanted to... I wanted to respond to those. I'm confused. Okay, well. <sighs> um, can you use the dot product to see if it's to the left or right somehow? Um, kind of, yes. Um, if you rotate it 90 degrees, that's what you're checking. Uh, you can also use something, this gets complicated, um, but what you're really looking for is the wedge product, uh, sometimes called the perpendicular dot product, sometimes called the exterior product, sometimes called the anti-symmetric product, uh, sometimes called um, the 2D cross product. So yes, you can use that. Also sometimes called the deter de determinants. And so that one is kind of the thing that is checking left and right instead of in front of and forward. Um, but um, we're not going to... We, 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 I haven't planned to talk about too much about that um, this, this time around. 
Uh, we're going to get into that as soon as we talk about trigonometry. Then we're going to mention it. What's the benefit of using square magnitude to magnitude and unity? Uh, squared magnitude is faster, but it is nonlinear. Um, and so it's, it's, you get the incorrect distance, uh, but if you're just checking if something is greater than or less than some threshold, um, then using the squared magnitude is faster because you're not doing the square root. So. Um, I remember one of the super chats, it was love what you're doing, keep it up. Oh, thanks. Uh, what do you call vector multiplication in a shader? Uh, the default multiplication of vectors in a shader is called the Hadamard product. Uh, Hadamard? I don't know how to pronounce it. It's probably some German or something. But Hadamard product is the component-wise multiplication of vectors, um, which is rarely used. You sometimes use it. Uh, it's kind of like if you want to scale each component by some value, so it's usually scale related. Uh, but you use it a lot in shaders because in shaders, uh, colors and vectors and positions are all interchangeable. Um, do you have to memorize all the trig functions? No, <laughs> definitely not. I mean, it can make you slightly more efficient, but I would just look it up. I look it up almost every time. Hadamard is French. Oh, Hadamard? Hadamard. I don't know. I don't know French. But um, something like that. Yes, the video will stay up on my YouTube channel. Um... Thanks for your videos. It basically taught me how to do my job. Heck yeah, I'm glad. Oh, Rania, do you want to be a moderator? Or would you would you prefer not to? I feel like I just want to moderate everyone who, who I know. <laughs> everyone who I know and trust. Okay, you're wrenched. I don't know if a wrench is becoming a moderator or getting banned. Um, uh, is there a textbook that corresponds with the course or textbook you can recommend? Um, no, the pro I, I actually, I have no clue about textbooks because I just, I haven't learned the things that I've learned through textbooks. And so a lot of that is just kind of outside of what I'm aware of. I'm sure there are textbooks, but I just don't, <laughs> I just don't know. Um, I'm sorry, it's a, it's a really shitty answer because it's annoying, um, but yeah. Most of what I've learned is from like having to implement things and then just Googling for how to solve it. Write a textbook, I've considered doing that. I actually started writing it. Uh, I made a prototype page. Um, Here you go, here's my prototype prototype page. I wanted to make an online um, online math book that was kind of like a Wikipedia, but it's actually readable for people trying to learn. Um, and so, so I, that page is my test, test page. Um, but I've considered making a bigger thing out of it, but I just haven't gotten to it because I'm kind of wrapped up in doing my uh, video project right now. Uh, my the sequel to the Bezier video. I've been working on it for about a year now, and I'm so tired of it. <laughs> I really want to release it. Um, but yeah. Um, but yeah, the uh, it's a video about splines. It's the again the sequel to the Bezier curve video. So I'm going to talk about talk about splines. What's gay? Uh, usually it's uh, referring to same-sex attraction, but it can be used to mean other things as well. Um, 
Okay. Cat has stopped protesting or is really quiet. Yeah, where where are the where are my kittens? Oh. <laughs> There's salad. I don't know if you can see. You can kind of see his butt sticking out of the window. And then there's another cat on top of the tree. Um, actually, how long have we been going for? Uh, okay. I don't want to hit the four hour mark because if I do that, then um, uh, YouTube is not going to put captions on this video because, because of course, because, you know, if a video is longer than four hours, the you can't automate captions anymore. It's just how the software works, you know? For some godforsaken reason. So I want to keep this under four hours. <laughs> Wait, is there a solar eclipse? Oh. Wait, when? So like now or soon? Um, too cloudy, yeah. It's happening right now, damn. Yeah, mostly, mostly see clowns. Auto caption software probably 32 bit and a four hour needs just about one gigabyte of memory, but then just do it twice in separate like things. I can upload 500 videos that are three hours and 59 minutes and it's gonna do it just fine. But if I upload one video that's four hours and 12 minutes, it's not gonna do it. And it's like, why? Fallon. Hello. Big yawn. What a good yawn. Yeah, so this is Salad, for those of you who haven't met Salad. You wanna sit in my lap? Come on, Salad. Are you going behind my monitors? Buddy. Oh jeez. Oh jeez. He's behind. He's just up to stuff. Boy. Is he gonna nap there now? In my engineering class, I learned vector dot cross product, but I just know the calculation, not the application. I feel like that, that's the big issue, right? Like, I feel like application should come first before you learn the thing. What kind of tablet do you have? Um, Wacom Intuos Pro, I think, medium. Ow. 
Um, okay. Anyway, um, anything else before I leave? Any other questions? How many cats do you own? Uh, we have three cats. We have salad, we have toast, and we have thar. We've been streaming for about three hours and 40 minutes. Uh, will the course cover sign distance fields? Um, not really. We're going to talk about that during the shader course, but not the math course. Um, yeah. The thing is, like, the we've already talked about signed distance, and so the field part usually comes into play when you have, like, a fragment shader or a texture that contains a field of signed distances, right? Um, Salad, you're being a little rascal. This, this, and this boy. <laughs> he flew for scooter. He flew for scooter. Will this be the same as your prior game dev classes? Um, yes, the first few lectures will be basically the same. Um, but the second week, depending on um, depending on how like what we're gonna talk about, I might do more lectures on things I didn't talk about last time. Yeah. And so there there's and usually like I don't have a super tight script that I'm following for my classes, and so they're always gonna be slightly different for better or for worse. Um, and it also depends on what the students want. Um, which topics were you thinking of covering week two? That just depends on what the students want to talk about. If they want to talk about splines, then I'll do that. If they want to talk about easing functions, I can do that. Um, if they want to talk about geometric algebra, I can do that too. <laughs> um, so it just depends on, depends on where things go. Whoa, goober, you little goober. He no want. You want to go someplace else. How far is the Bezier video? Uh, the Bezier video was done like a little bit over a year ago, but the spline video I am still working on. It is almost done. Uh, it's, I, I'm just, I have a tiny bit left to work on. Um, and uh, Jazz Mickle is also working on the music for it. So whenever both of us are done, uh, that's when it's gonna, that's when we're gonna release it. Hey! Sandin! Criminal! You just knocked down my tablet pen. No! 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 <clears throat> Would love a geometric algebra class, but I'm not sure it's super relevant for first year. It's super useful though. Oh yeah, it's, it's completely useless, um, but I'm thinking I'll, I'm going to go through all of the relevant bits during the first week. And then the second week, I'm going to basically field whatever people want to talk about and then pick out the more useful things out of that. So if someone, if nobody has any suggestion, except someone really wants to talk about geometric algebra, I can do that. Uh, but it's unlikely. Um, Uh, is NURBS mentioned in the upcoming video? Uh, yes, but I'm not going to get into them in detail. They're mostly mentioned at the end. Um, I wanted to go into detail for NURBS for the video, uh, but I'm not going to... I didn't have time for it, and so it's not going to be in the spline video, but I might do it in the future. I mention them, I talk about how they work, and I talk about B-splines, just not full-on NURBS until the very end. Salad. That is my... That's my pop filter. Don't eat my pop filter. This is criminal activities. Hey. Especially hyped for the spline video since every time I tried reading up on it myself, I quickly discovered that every article contradicts each other. Yeah, it's kind of annoying. <laughs> 
What's a biarc and what's it used for? Um, it's a type of spline that is using circular arcs exclusively. Um, and th that it's used for whenever you want to do just circular arcs and, um, and that, and that's what it's used for. Like if you want to have a spline where, um, it's really important that you have a fast arc length parameterization, then you would use it. Um, otherwise I don't think there are that many use cases for bi arcs. Uh, generally you would use something else. Um, um, is there a way to benchmark shaders? Um, just read your GPU numbers and try it, change your shaders, do AB testing. That's what I do. Have you ever made a video about quaternions? I cover them a little bit during my math course. Um, and I will during this one too. Um, but I don't really talk about how they work internally. I just talk about how to use them and how to think about rotation in unity. How old are your cats? Uh, this big boy is uh, eight months. Um, okay. Yeah, he's technically a kitten. Um, he acts like one, but he kind of doesn't really look like one. <laughs> he's very large. Yeah, he's like, he's like five, f five point something kilograms now, I think. Salad? What are you doing? Hey, don't eat my monitors. Yes, the stream will stay live after I end the stream. Salad, hey, you goobered. Don't eat the monitors. Yeah, no, yes, you wiggle, you wiggle. <sighs> this boy, this boy, he is, he is a boy. Still hate NFTs? Yeah, they seem pointless. I don't know what, why, why? <laughs> I don't hate them as much as long as it's like, it seems like proof of work crypto was absolutely trash garbage for society and the planet. Uh, proof of stake seems slightly better, but it's still kind of pointless. I don't see why, why? <laughs> like, it just seems like a complicated way to do transactions that you can already do. Um, it, I feel like it's, it's very much a, um, solution looking for a problem to solve. Um, and I don't see the use case for them right now. And then it's also dubious, like how much of a solution it actually even is. So. Um, salad, stop eating cables. Yeah, no. I don't know how to deal with this boy. I don't know, no, no. It's still, still criminal. Illegal. Boy. Hey. Hey, Goober Scooter. Hey. <laughs> you try stable diffusion or other types of AI? Uh, I am at the point where I absolutely fucking hate AI uh, for generating quote unquote art. Uh, and so, no, <laughs> I have not. I am, I am, I am fine with the shitty AI that generate funny memes like Dolly or whatever. But as soon as it starts encroaching upon art, I am deeply uncomfortable with the implication to art society as a whole. Uh, and so I, I am very much against the type of AI that is generating, um, 
quote-unquote art pieces, especially if it's stolen art that was taken without people's consent. Um, and so, so yeah, no, I have not been playing with stable diffusion because I think it is morally reprehensible. Look at this criminal. Look at this criminal. With your preamp broken, are you doing the audio chain of software? Your mic sounds great. Is hardware processing worth it? Hardware processing is not really that worth it, no. I mostly did it because I like having hardware. <laughs> it's fun, but... You don't think it could be a tool for artists to use instead of replace them? Yeah, I mean, it can be, but I worry that it's going to go much further than that. Like, as a tool, if it's like, oh, we can use it to, uh, like, remove JPEG artifacts, great. That's a nice use of AI. I'm for that. But as soon as it starts doing composition, as soon as it starts doing like the entire color, as soon as it starts creating an entire scene, then no, I don't think we should use AI for this because now we're taking the creativity away from the humans and then we're just leaving the like then we're just leaving the cleanup work for the humans. And then who's really the robot? <laughs> like if we just use AI to generate the entire concepts and then we just use humans to clean it up, I think that is a deeply dystopian future. I think art like the process of making art, I think has value in and of itself and to reduce it to just a product, to just a means to an end, I think is insulting. And I think it, it's just harmful for society. I think art has more value than that. Right, Salad? Right? And so that's why I do not like this uh, thing. You being against such AI won't change a thing, it will come. Also, if you believe our minds are only material, then there's no difference. Uh, I hard disagree with what you say. There is absolutely a difference. Um, and the if to me, it sort of sounds like, okay, if, if you... Um, there's a new technology on the horizon, and it will murder every child. Um, and then I'm like, okay, this technology sucks. I think we should legislate against it. I think we should not do this thing. I think murdering every child is something very bad. And then you're like, but this technology will come. That, that's not an argument as for why we should let it happen, right? Uh, there are many things that people are working on that I think are bad, that we shouldn't do. And AI art falls into that category for me. Um, yeah, so that's how I, that's how I see it. Miyazaki reaction? Yes, I strongly believe this is an insult to life itself. Isn't that a false equivalency? It's not an equivalency, it was an analogy. But, um, you know. You know. Yeah, Salad, you're eating cables. That's why I'm holding you here, because you're being a little rascal. You're being a rascal. Boop, 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 boop. Okay, anyway. Um, he's off in the plastic. Anyway, the comparison isn't valid. We can claim that creativity is only for humans only because we're the only one doing it. Once AI does it, we need to change our definitions. I think this is a bad future. I'm saying that prescriptively, humans should be the ones to do art. I don't think AI should do art. And so it's just a moral prescription. Um, and so you can disagree with that if you want, but that's how I see it right now. Um... Okay. <laughs> anyway. Um, I think it's like worrying that GitHub Copilot is taking programmers' jobs. And ironically, I am also worried about that, but a little bit less so. Um, because games, the, the code in games is generally pretty complex. Uh, but yeah, and ironically, I don't think 
I think it would be, I think we would lose something if the craft of programming and the craft of creating visual art is just dropped and just left to computers. I think we lose something, something very important. Um, and I don't think we should drop that. Like I like a lot of these AI conversations are really frustrating to me because like a lot of people seem to think that everything is just about the end result and that the process doesn't matter. And I think that is just such a like misunderstanding of what what art even is. Like people don't make art just to get results. People make art because they actually enjoy the process of creating it. They enjoy learning that skill. They enjoy doing that. And, and to just say, well, we should just turn this into an AI thing. I disagree. I don't think we should. I think, I think that, is, that is bad. Like there are so many other better uses of AI. Like, I don't know, we can, we can use AI to, uh, what's the like protein folding thing? We can use AI to figure out like molecular stuff and a shitload of stuff in science. We can use it to like, uh, again, like clean up JPEG artifacts or like do like tedious work that nobody can or wants to do. That's what AI should be used for. But as soon as it starts taking over composition and color and lighting and like everything that artists care about and want to do, then I think we have gone too far. And I think that is bad. Um, and so, so right now I feel like it, it's, I don't think it's something we should do, especially not when it starts like stealing people's art and using that as their like basis for their models. I think that is immoral and I don't think we should do it. Um, and I think models should only be trained on like consensually given art. Um, and right now the most popular ones are not. <sighs> anyway, okay, I shouldn't rant about this too much. I'm going to go insane. I actually care a lot about this topic and I get really frustrated. <laughs> and so <laughs> I shouldn't, I shouldn't delve too deep into this. This is actually in some cases throwing me into feeling really shitty for like the rest of the day. Um, if I go too deep. So, so I, I'm, uh, Anyway, are there any other questions? <sighs> Math? I don't know if that's a question, just because you put a question mark at the end. Calculus, relevance to game development. Um, if you're doing a lot of stuff that integrates over time, like if you're writing a physics engine, calculus is going to be really important. Uh, it's going to be useful if you're doing a rendering sometimes, if you're doing volumetric stuff, uh, that kind of stuff. How do you press a shape like a five-pointed star into a flat plane to make a 90 degree walled imprint in unity? I have no idea what that is asking. Do you have any advice for people who aren't strong in math skills wanting to learn math for game development? Yes, my course on YouTube. Uh, this one is not edited, uh, but the previous one on my channel is edited and a little bit tighter than just this live format. Uh... Oh, there are older students tuning in. That's really neat. How do you keep yourself from forgetting 90% of the math you learn in courses? Um, mostly through using them um, in the work that I do. Um. Uh, do you do anything outside of work to keep your, <laughs> keep you so smart? I don't know if I'm smart. Um, I do not do any other mental exercise apart from doing the work that I do. Um, but, um, no, no, I don't think I have anything like I, I, I just try to do work and then through doing work, I learn the things that I do and that's what I want to do. And so. That's true. I do regularly get nerd sniped on Discord, unfortunately. 
I help too many people on Discord. Like generally companies would have to pay me to have my like consulting services, but the secret is that I actually give it out for free sometimes on Discord because the problem is just so interesting that I need to do it, so. Yes, the class is over. We're doing post post class chatting right now. Um, oh yeah, we're cl closing up on the four hours. Uh, check the description of this video if you want links to my stuff. Uh, if you want, you can support me on Patreon. I have a link there as well. Um, I, that I also try to insist, I tell future games that I really want to do this publicly as well so that other people can take part and learn. Uh, if you want to join my Discord, I have a link there if you want to hop in. Um, and there's a flying salad in the background. Um, but thank you all for joining. Um, and Windows is currently covering the timer. Um, okay, thank you all for joining. I have to end before four hours. Um, and uh, thank you, thank you so much for for joining. We're gonna do another class tomorrow, and so feel free to tune in. And I'm gonna put up a, a pre pre roll YouTube video uh, on my channel if you wanna if you wanna enable notifications for that if you don't wanna miss it. But thank you all so much for joining, and and I will see you all tomorrow if you join. Otherwise, I will not see you. Uh, but but thank you so much, and I will I will see you all next time.